Good evening and welcome to the June 9th, 2021 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, I'm First Selectman Jim Hayden and I call this meeting to order at 6.31. And we welcome everyone back to a live in-person meeting. Uh, we are socially distanced, we've all been vaccinated and we're proceeding in, with the brave new world of how it used to be. So we got a call to order at 631, public comment. I don't see any at this point, so no public comment. Uh, we uh, have a presentation from the economic development officers and from the uh, uh, our, uh, our development officer, and we um, are going to do that shortly, but I think we can get through some of these things very quickly. First, uh, uh, next order of business is correspondence. Uh, the police log is in there uh, from May. There was 627 calls for service and 11 uh, accidents, 10 tickets, 27 medicals, 22 citizen assist, 7 motorist assist, 20 alarms, um, and uh, 2 domestics and 1 arrest. On the um, May tax collector report. There, uh, it, the collection rate is 99.15%. Uh, so it's another year. I believe it's four out of five years that we've had a 99% collection rate. And especially to have a collection rate of 99% during COVID was certainly something uh, that we thank the taxpayers of East Granby for uh, their fastidiousness and the tax collectors for their hard work to ensure that the rate was uh, at 99.15 percent. The um, Board of Finance uses 98 percent as a budget number, so that would be additional revenue placed over budget. So that would be additional money that will actually go down to the bottom line. Uh, the, um, I've got the summary sheet for the general government. We're, we're trending um, a little bit better than the contingency. We're trending in the sixty to seventy thousand uh, dollar return. The contingency is fifty four percent. When we talk about uh, proposed transfers, we'll get into more detail. Uh, we uh, annually get a equalized net grant list report uh, from OPM, and. That's 100%, uh, it's an estimate of 100% of the value of all taxable property uh, in our town, and it's $936,219,000. When you times it times 70%, which is the net assessment, um, the uh, uh, it's $606,985,000. That uh, was uh, reconciled by the assessor, and they match. So uh, that's just the new report. The, uh, just to remind you, the Board of Finance meets on Tuesday, June 15th. Uh, so we'll have a special meeting uh, uh, to set the town meeting in time and date on Wednesday, June 16th. Uh, the notice will be put in the paper for June 18th and the town meeting will be the 24th. Uh, we will set the time of the meeting and the date at our special meeting on the 16th. And it's our pleasure we we'll, we'll want to do 7 or 7.30. Any preference? Well, for our meeting or for the town meeting? Town meeting. When do we typically have it? So 7.30, but some of the meetings have started to do 7, so. I suggest 7. That's what we've been doing with, uh, as far as the town meeting. Just yeah, the town meeting's been uh, 7.30 before, but you're okay with 7? Sure. Okay. I mean, you're not, you don't think you're going to have some people show up at 7.30 and basically miss the meeting. Not too many people show up to these anyway, but... <laughs> I mean... We can make it 7.30, and uh, then uh, with all the publicity we do for future town meetings, we can make sure that it's 7 o'clock. Seems to be uh, one that works for uh, a lot of people too, and they're, uh, it's going to be in-person meeting also. So it's uh, it's not the time we want to uh, 
although I think seven, it makes sense. Um, it may not be the time when we want to change if somebody wants to come out. And we've got eight capital items of our own, so there could be some interest. So. Okay. Uh, we received uh, a letter uh, addressed to the airport uh, from a resident at the airport news, noise. Um, I also um, gave you a letter regarding a letter that I wrote on behalf of the East Bambi Land Trust, who may have an opportunity to acquire a, a parcel or two uh, by Seymour School, and uh, they uh, may be putting in a request to the uh, East Granby, get the formal name of it, it's East Granby Together, uh, let's see, East Granby Greater Together, um, which is funded by the Hartford Foundation. Uh, they've got a cutoff of uh, June 15th to get uh, projects uh, applied for. Uh, they are giving uh, up to $50,000 away, and not giving, but funding $50,000. Uh, projects, so you can, if you have a project, you can rate uh, anywhere from $250 to $25,000. Anyway, so this was just a letter of support because this particular parcel is adjacent to, uh, contiguous to the uh, Seymour School and it actually goes to Granbrook. So if they put this together, uh, it would be able to have, uh, you know, passive trails that they could have. We could have a lot of, uh, of uh, educational curriculum with the, um, you know, with the Salmon Brook. So there's a lot of positives to that. So I believe the land trust is going to, they're looking at a 15 acre and a 23 acre parcel and um, they may be looking for funding. Uh, there's uh, uh, negotiations with the landowner now and uh, we'll see see what happens. But I just want to let you know that uh, AIDS, I can remind everybody about the uh, East Granby um, Greater Together uh, and also that the Land Trust is looking to uh, acquire some acreage that would add to the open space, but more significantly be a direct link to Salmon Brook for Seymour School. Jim, is most of this land wetland since it's next to the brook? Yeah, it's, it's wetlands and it's, um, you know, it's, it's not, it, it was owned by, um, you know, tobacco companies, but it wasn't necessarily under cultivation. So it's not easily wetland. accessed, it wouldn't, it's not really something viable or developable? No, in essence. no it's, it's minimal. Uh, I'm looking at the community development director. So uh, floodplains are wetlands? It is, okay. Whole piece is pretty much entirely so. Right, because I noticed that, you know, they're basically selling one and donating the other, so is the other one basically landlocked or? Yeah, the other one is landlocked and is, you know, completely wetlands, but it is, it is adjacent to, you know, uh, Grand Brook Park contiguous to Salmon Brook, so uh, it would be a valuable piece for as an expansion for Grand Brook Park as well. Uh, the other piece is currently being leased by one of the adjacent farmers okay. um, that you know farms the property behind the school, uh, but that again is all floodplain as well, so it's not, not developable property. Would the town still be able to continue allowing the farmer to well, it wouldn't be townland, it would be the land trust land, uh, and I, my understanding is they would encourage that. Okay. And do they have enough money, or I know they have some funds from all the, uh, when you develop a lot, I guess you have to get 10% back or whatever, so would most of that come from there, or would it come from? Well, the land trust is a separate independent 501c3 that, uh, that raises their own funding. Uh, so they would use their own funds or greater funds. Okay, so it wouldn't be purchased by, I mean, they wouldn't be looking for the town to contribute anything to this, no. would they? No. 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 What it is is they were looking for, for town support for the grant application, and they were also looking to see if it's something that we wanted to have happen, which we think would be a great thing to happen. Right, okay. Next uh, correspondence was from a resident who was concerned about the climate culture team at the schools, uh, and uh, he, had, he and I had written a couple of letters to each other. I encouraged him to attend the Board of Ed meeting or to um, talk to the Board of Ed or, um, or to the superintendent or the chair of the Board of Education. Uh, 
regarding uh, his concerns. It's got some really valid concerns. It's an extremely divisive program that they have here. The, um, you know, and, and certainly uh, to learn more about it, uh, you should uh, contact uh, the board of ed chair or the superintendent or attend uh, some of the board of education meetings. There was a climate uh, culture report maybe a month ago and I did attend the that meeting. It was extremely one-sided. And then we have uh, the information from the Central Connecticut Solid Waste Authority. Um, they're uh, looking at uh, the title of the slides for municipal solid waste crisis. And as we've talked, there we are as a state going through one. Uh, Mira is going to be shutting its plants out at the Meadows uh, in June of 2022. They are obligated to handle pressure from the towns through 2027, but at what price or cost? Next up is for CISWA and the uh, and the uh, CROG uh, Municipal uh, Committee to uh, work together and work with DEEP. Uh, but at this point, uh, it appears that Mira will shut down its operation at the Meadows, still providing service, but looking to do a transfer station instead of a trash to energy plant. At one of our last CISWA meetings, they mentioned that the state may have thrown a wrench into that with Mira. They weren't sure if the state would allow them to use the transfer station. The, um, the Mira's position, and I am on the Mira Board of Directors, uh, the Mira's position uh, from staff and attorneys is that the, uh, the current uh, permit allows them to do that. Deep is all is taking the contrary opinion on that, and um, you know there are ongoing discussions and talks uh, to see uh, what's going on. But it would be going to a transfer station, and you know for, perhaps at the Meadows, uh, and then you know the trash ends up in you know Ohio or Pennsylvania or having the trucks go directly to one of the remaining, uh, two, or two, two of the remaining trash to energy plants in Connecticut, or uh, going uh, to New York or to uh, Massachusetts with the trash and then it goes out to Pennsylvania or Ohio. Or Ohio. There are certainly options, uh, uh, but there is a, there certainly is a continuing disagreement between Deep and Mira on the strategy. They're absolutely right. A lot to go between now and the year from now. And that's not that long of a It's not that long at all. Well, they're right on a rail line, so it's perfect. Loaded onto trucks, on the, on the rail cars. Yeah, as, as you know, Deep doesn't allow them to do it. What are you going to do? That's bringing right. to the Deep plant. So a lot of have to, I mean, there's contingencies, but it's a lot easier if the uh, if we're um, if Mira is allowed to make the necessary accommodations to make it into the transfer station. Great. Okay, I uh, added to your uh, your package the treasurer's report. Um, we. Uh, look good on the money that we've received from, from a revenue perspective from the state. The only thing that's missing is the municipal grant aid of 537000 I believe they're waiting to bond that, and that is the session going on, legislative session going on. We anticipate that we will receive that before the end of the year. And um, uh, with... Uh, when you, you look at all the revenue, we're at 99.2%, so we're almost at 100% of budget already. And then when you throw in another $500,000, uh, there will be uh, more revenue than was projected in the budget. And it appears that there'll be less expenditures than was uh, appeared. The Board of Education appears that they'll be returning money, and we will be returning less money than what we're used to, but we still are, as I mentioned, probably in the Fifty to seventy thousand dollar range. In the one line, it's a negative number, the negative twenty-two thousand. You know what that was? It's on the first page, towards the bottom. In the May revenues. I uh, I I have a, a question into the treasurer on that to see what that that was. Yeah, 
I don't think we've ever had a negative on there. So yeah, it, 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 I'm sure it's a I'm sure it's a, a, a monthly uh, charge that will be offset uh, in June. But uh, I uh, noticed that also and asked the treasurer to let me know what that was. Yeah. Next uh, order of business is the minutes from May 26. Make a motion to approve them. I'll second. Any additions, deletions, corrections? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 John, you're used to say you're raising yeah. your hand because of the Zoom aye. camera. I did the same thing. <laughs> okay, so a motion passed unanimously. Um, old business real quick. Um, school town report 5A. Uh, paving update, Huckleberry Pleasant View Drive, Longview Drive, and 50% of Heather are complete. 50% of Heather, Tumbridge Road, Cobblestone, and Penny Whistle will be next up and within the next couple weeks. I think they're starting milling next week. And DPW has done all the drain, uh, drain work uh, and uh, is addressing drainage issues uh, as they go along. All Grove uh, Electric, the upgrade is complete. The project starts next week um, uh, to uh, put the air conditioning units in and uh, is on schedule to be completed by August 1st. Jim, do they actually receive the units? Are they on site? Uh, I, I'm not sure if they're on site or not. Uh, he has told us that there isn't an issue with that and he just put a, uh, he just put a, uh, uh, you know, one of the okay, storage Hats. vehicles oh. uh, there. Containers. So he's container. Right. So he's got. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he's got some things that he'll add to that. Okay. And so let's see. The economic development report. Um, the uh, I don't think there's been any meeting yet. Uh, well, there was last month. Uh, yes. But we're getting a lot of the economic development report tonight. So. Good portion of it, yes. It will be part of the presentation. And uh, back office shared opportunities, uh, shared services, uh, no movement on that. Long-term recovery committee, uh, have you got a meeting scheduled for that? Um, no, not at this point. We, uh, we're getting more information on federal funding, uh, and so there's projects that we can use the long-term recovery committee to help us decide what to use it for. So if we're able to, you know, get a, uh, do we need to get any additional members on it or have we still got enough members on it? We can always use additional members, but we have a sufficient amount that's okay. worked well. So, so then, uh, you know, then we, you know, it's, you know, now that we're starting to get guidance on what we can use the federal funding for, the long-term recovery committee will come in uh, and be very useful. So I look forward to attending future meetings. And it took me 19 minutes. I didn't think it was going to take me that many to get to our new business, which is the tax incentive report from the town's economic development. Uh, Director and our economic development officers, um, and Gary, why don't you? Sure. Um, we'll do the presentation up at the podium, and I'll run the slideshow for you. But my name is Gary Haynes. I'm the director of community development for the town of East Granby. We have our economic development staff uh, working with us on an incentive or economic development incentive uh, recommendations for the board of selectmen, as Joe Doring and John Zio Rono being former members, uh, one of the things that we've taken a look at is kind of analyzing what some other towns have for economic development incentives uh, around the regional area. We've taken a look at the marketplace and been working with, in coordination with the Economic Development Commission on presenting to you tonight the presentation and rec ultimately recommendations that we think the town would, would be served in going forward with adoption at some point. And, adopting a formal uh, program that would help us attract businesses to the town of East Grand. So, And the process for that would be eventually for the Board of Selectmen to act upon uh, an incentive program and then uh, go to the Board of Finance to get their input and then ultimately to a uh, town meeting. Correct. 
Uh, many towns are uh, via st uh, state statute are allowed to adopt tax abatement programs, as you as you know through the general statutes. Most of them are uh, languages that are written through your ordinances that you know acknowledge the, the proposed process that basically give you the authority to adopt an abatement program. Um, so we have some guidelines and parameters that we'd like to introduce to you tonight. And I'll introduce you to Adam Takasha and Sandra Johnson, both part of our economic development staff. My camera? You sure are. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I can stand. All right. Well, good evening. I'm Adam Takachik. I'm one of the directors of economic development here for the town of East Granby. Uh, I live in East Granby as well. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, the last 15 years I've been a tax consultant, primarily engaged in economic development incentives uh, from federal new market tax credits, uh, historic tax credits, job creation tax credits at the federal, going down to the state level. A lot of, a lot of my work and clients are in New Jersey or Buffalo. Um, in total, during the last 15, 15 years, I've secured about $500 million of tax credits and incentives for, for, for companies and have been involved in many site selection uh, projects. Uh, last five years I've been a, uh, kind of went off on my own and became an independent consultant, did this on my own out of my home office, out of Sterling Point Capital. Uh, it's about 40 million now, just, just under 40 million of incentives I've negotiated for clients and I've done some site selection work with them as well. I'm also a partner at Vontu Industrial Holdings, where just a group of private investors who buy companies, often distressed, but we're manufacturing and uh, um, uh, industrial companies. Uh, you know, so that's part of something that I do. And, and Quality Foods is a, uh, we're down in Voorhees, New Jersey. It's a former client of mine. When I was working with a uh, consulting firm, you can't take equity or kind of roll up your sleeves and actually join the company that you're, you know, you're serving. But when you're independent, I did. And uh, we're doing really well. But I, I worked on the financing, site selection, and um, uh, yeah, those, those financing and site selection for, uh, for a startup. We're now processing 240,000 pounds of chicken and beefsteak. Uh, a week in, uh, in Fort Hayes, New Jersey. So we're doing really well, and I'm a small minority owner in that. In the past, I worked with a consulting firm called Duff and Phelps in Manhattan. That's where I did a bulk of the incentive work, uh, and I was also a lobbyist for, in a couple of cases, for um, some Fortune 500 companies. And before that, I worked with uh, Empire State Development Corporation. Uh, this is New York State's premier economic development agency where the folks who manage all the attraction projects that come to the state, kind of at the state level, and I'll, in that job, I also work with a lot of local economic development agencies and, and folks like Gary and myself now in this role. Um, so uh, there you go, that's, that's who I am. And I bring that all up just to say, I've been involved in the incentives world for a little while. So you know, you make sausage and now you're asked to do it again, I'll, I'll give you some of my insights as to what I think is really going on and what's, what's the point of all of this. So, uh, next slide. Sandra, oh, Sandra. Wanna, yeah, please. Introduce yourself as well. So Adam, Adam comes to us with more of kind of that financing background. He's been very integral in helping a lot of our businesses through COVID with their PPP loans as well as uh, some of the grant and uh, revitalization programs. Uh, I'll let Sandra introduce herself. Sandra. Hi, I'm Sandra Johnson, and I'm working in, the, in our town, also as a resident here, so a proud uh, economic developer here for East Granby, I'm working with Gary and Adam, and my background is economic development, working originally with the Capital Region Growth Council, which then became the Metro Hartford Alliance, and so I was part of the original founding of the Metro Hartford Alliance, and have left, uh, had led until 2014 the region's uh, business recruitment, retention, and expansion efforts for the Hartford region. So I too have had, you know, um, experience in a lot of different projects. Uh, the Walgreens Distribution Center, that's that's close by, as an example. StubHub was was a uh, company that I worked with to bring in to East Granby. So I, I can um, say that over the years I've worked with industrial companies as well as uh, commercial office companies, with site selectors. I, 
actually Adam came to one of our site selection way way back what way way back when uh, to a site selectors tour um, so I, I come with a different perspective from Adam and together I think with Gary Adam and I I think it's, it's really forged a good mix for our town great Jim I, I would second that uh, just participating in some of the meetings with both Adam and Sandra and Gary uh, very impressive and bring a lot to the town. I think we're very fortunate to have that. And I think we're seeing a lot of, uh, of momentum and forward progress. So. Yeah, I think even Thank though you. it's been a part-time staff, I think one of the things that's been helpful is they play off of each other as yes. a team very well. So, you know, Sandra's knowledge with the, working with the Metro Hartford Alliance and some of the regional contacts, um, you know, having experience with the commercial brokers. It's really one of the things that we weren't getting, you know, weren't, weren't really integrating enough is getting out there and having conversations with the brokers because the only way you're going to change that image with, with the commercial brokers is if, you know by having conversations with them so um, she's been helpful in that process and adam i think is you know added a lot to the incentive aspect to it so and so what, what we're going to go over here is collaborative effort with sandra gary myself the edc members um so this has been through many meetings and conversations and refinements, and it will be a continual process till we, till we finalize it. But we think we've got something good here with a lot of uh, input from, from many folks. So here we go. Why do people choose a site? Why do companies choose a site? On the left-hand side of this slide, th there's just things that matter. The site has to work. You know, you've got to be able to fit your building, your manufacturing plant, and then almost always, People who have tried, if you built a manufacturing plant, your first thought is, how am I going to get the labor for it? So availability of labor is one of the next thing that's important. It's got to work for your customers. And then typically, the CEOs, investors, the high top management need to enjoy the schools and the weather. And it all has got to be there. You know, if, if you've got somebody who's from the southwest of the country, they're, they're not going to think. They don't want to spend the winter in Buffalo, for example. <laughs> so we dealt with this a lot when I worked in the state of New York. Um, at the very bottom is incentives. So we're just saying up front, from an economic perspective, those are the things that matter more than anything from high rank to low rank. Incentives are really at the low end. However, when they're deciding on where to go, incentives are nearly always the first thing they're going to ask about. The reason for this, I think it's because there's a principal agent problem. When companies hired me, I'm really being hired by a middle manager who's trying to build up a resume to get promoted and get his bonus at the end of the year. And so everyone's incentivized, if you will, to really show on paper how much money we've saved, what we're getting out of the site, who are the, what are the concessions we've received, and everybody can pat themselves on the back, you know, the lawyers, accountants, consultants, me, brokers, <clears throat> middle management, whoever, all the all the agents involved in the site selection decision are going to start up at incentives. And I'll give you an, an example. Um, I worked with, a, what was it, Johnson? Uh, JCI. Uh, JCI was the name of the company. Um, Johnson Controls, OK? Uh, down in Pennsylvania. And as a consulting firm, we knew they were going to build a $150 million plant. We wanted to know which town would give us a property tax payment. We sat down with three school districts because they're the ones that have the big property, the levy the largest property taxes, and the school would have to come on board. We sat down at a at a library in Harrisburg area. Three towns came in. We met with them, served donuts and coffee. Two of them, two of the two of the towns said, the school districts said, no, I don't think we're really on board, or we'll have to consider offering you an incentive. One of them said, yeah, we'll give you an incentive. It was the. Uh, uh, the woman who managed the, uh, Dr. Kaufman was her name, and she, she was the superintendent for the schools. She didn't give any money out. She didn't say how much of an incentive. All she said is, yeah, we'd love to chat with you about incentives. Well, since we're being paid, you know, we have like four staff on, you know, it's hundreds of dollars an hour, thousands actually at the end of the day that they're paying for. We ended up going to that town, <laughs> and they put their plant there before they knew what the incentive value was going to be. It was only because they were the one of the three that said, yes, we considered offering an incentive. And because we were hired to get incentives, we persuaded JCI to go and look for incentives. And the whole thing started up here. And at the end of the day, they picked a site that was a little more expensive than if they had done a little more due diligence further. 
Um, there's a big slope to it, lots of bedrock under the surface, that'd be a lot of blasting, but it was really pretty and there were incentives, and so that's where we went. And that leads to your final decision. And I think what we have is a principal agent problem. When you're dealing with a business owner and they're the ones making the decision, they're gonna be looking at the left side of that, how, left side of that sheet. However, anybody else involved in the process is gonna start with incentives and then work their way down. So the whole point of this, is if you flip this next slide, is to get the phone call. Here's an email I got, he's grandy. You know, good morning, Adam, blah, 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 blah. Do you have any incentives that you can offer us? <laughs> That's always going to be the lead. Always, always. This is a broker, somebody getting paid by how much money I'm saving you. So the point of incentives, I feel, having done all this, is to get that phone call, to have something to talk about, to market yourself. Um, when real estate broker, commercial real estate brokers are asked for, do, do a site selection for us, come up with some sites and offer incentives, which ones offer incentives? We want to be in the we offer incentives bucket. And that's, that's really the point. It puts us on the radar. It's, it starts these types of conversations. Um, Can I just, I absolutely. Just, You're I just, actually up on the next slide, but go ahead. Well, I just want to mention that um, an example that's close, and I mentioned the Walgreens Distribution Center. When we were vying for that, Rhode Island really wanted that distribution center. And so in the end, they were offering considerably more in incentives. What we were offering and, and when I was speaking with them is the connection to be bringing in, they wanted to have 40% um, or 45% of their workers to be disabled workers. So we were able to say we would be able to uh, work with, the, with goodwill, with workforce development, with all these different ent entities to help to bring that level of labor to their, to their operation. And at the end, Connecticut was able to win the, uh, the project and again, we were in it because we were offering incentives, but we, Rhode Island was offering far more for them. And they probably could have sourced out uh, employees as well, but we you know, really made the effort. So you know, it ties in directly with what Adam's talking about. Yeah, and this is, this is you, Sandra. If you wouldn't mind chatting about how the commercial brokers are saying about us and... You know, one, of, one of the principal roles that we had is uh, Sandra's been, been really been working with trying to establish a, conversations with the commercial brokers and one of our first steps was really to try to identify what you know given their input what their image of East Gravity really was so uh, you know and these are some of the, the, the things that uh, you know naturally came to their you know to their thought process and I'll let Sandra kind of fill you in on the, the discussions that she's had. Well, it was, it was an easy introduction because I've known the brokers for so many years, so that was good. They were happy to hear that I was here. They were happy to hear from me what um, a genuine uh, excitement about being here in East Granby because I believe and, and I, I know that we have a town that is easy to work with. And just from any, any experience I've had, um, Jim would be able to meet us with a prospect anywhere. Gary's able to talk with whomever. So that doesn't happen everywhere, and I feel really fortunate about that. But a lot of times brokers are not as comfortable about knowing who they can go, go to. So um, having that relationship, having them know that I'm here, touching base with them, how's it going, what are you seeing you know, in the market, and so, you know, right now, at the end of 2020, if you take a look, there, the vacancy rate was like 20% in our region. That's huge. And the impact is really being delayed right now because uh, companies are on lease, and where they make, the lease may expire, they're doing short-term extensions. So there still may be other, um, other fallout that's going to come from that. And the brokers are expecting the vacancies to go up and the rates to go down. So again, back to what Adam's talking about and Gary's talking about, what we're working together and what I call forward thinking business development, really looking at what we can do to differentiate ourselves, what kinds of businesses might be attractive to our town and to our, our properties. And our incentives proposal is a way that I believe would give me something to talk with the brokers about. Now, um, when I ask them about East Granby and how they see us, and they see us as a small town, they see us as a small population, we know that for what we have, we're not going to be able to bring in a grocery store at this point, but we are suited because of our traffic count for convenience-oriented 
uh, development, which we've seen in the service stations that have populated Route 20. Um, we're good for small and medium-sized manufacturing. We're extremely fortunate that we weathered COVID really well. Many other towns didn't do as well as we did. And I would say that um, what was positive for us is that as soon as we saw COVID, I mean, Gary brought us together and we started calling all of our businesses and directly making outreach to our businesses, retail as, as well as our uh, industrial businesses. Adam worked closely with, with the uh, helping with loans and keeping abreast of any of the financial opportunities that could be there for them. So that, that was one side. Our brokers knew we were doing that. And the word was getting around that we've been there. Uh, one broker called me because he represented um, uh, J.B. Hunt. And they were looking for an expansion of the, for their parking. And they were getting concerned that it seemed like it was taking too long, or was it taking too long, or was it really going to happen? And I was able to assure them, in fact, Yes, here's what's happening. They're working with Gary, you know, and working with the commission, and everything is moving forward. And what I'd get back as soon as as soon as it was approved, I would text. I texted the uh, broker, said, "Here, you know, it's all passed. Everything's ready to go." And you get the response back. If there's anything that you need, don't hesitate to call. If there's anything you want to know, don't hesitate to call. So we've got already building even more that relationship here within our here within our town. Okay. Um, now, why do you have a go to the last one? Limited development opportunities. I think we have quite a bit. We have quite a bit of raw land, fairly large parcels right along the major route, route 20. Limited development. The, the brokers have that opinion because of the size of some of the, some of the parcels. So, you know, a lot of people look at the you know uh, when they're looking for development potential, they're looking at the size of the parcel that you can develop on. So. Uh, East Granby does have some vacant parcels, uh, so we definitely do have that, but it's not, you know, when you look at a town like Windsor where there's a large contiguous acreage uh, of land, uh, we have one or two parcels that are over, you know, even 30 acres for uh, commercial development. So a lot of a lot of our commercial parcels are smaller than in size, so that was the reason for and that. And there may be other wetlands or, or some other encumbrance that goes along, you know, with with the particular property and where they want to be. Yeah, may maybe for bigger things, but you know, I was talking about like the 10 or 20 acre parcels that we mm -hmm. have along Route 20. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have several. Yeah, yeah. we have several. That seem to yeah. be high and dry, you know, good site visibility so close to the airport, right next well, to the, the airport connector. the brokers are aware of that. I yeah. talk with the brokers on that. I know who has that. We've had, uh, I can say we've had more prospect activity during COVID than anyone would imagine. Mm -hmm. And we have presented those properties you know, we've had good visibility. We've been able to be out front. And I think it's been helpful that um, being involved with the region over the number of years, they'll reach out and they know that I'm going to produce something for them to be able to include in their package. And so, you know, through Gary with helping with mapping and being able to produce whatever we need, we're in the process of putting together slick sheets right now on our properties so that it makes it even easier for us to, uh, to present. So I, I think we're presenting ourselves as a unified team. And I think it's important to note that that was the perception from the brokers mm -hmm. and that we know that we have to overcome that. And some of the things... And that's that what I'm talking about. Those are all the, these are all ways that we're working right now to establish ourselves um, as maybe a small town that, that can act big, mm -hmm. you know, be able to do things bigger towns can do. Yeah, and that, that, that's kind of what... You know, when we have those conversations with the commercial brokers, they kind of look at East Granby as a small town. Um, you know, and letting them know how we can change that image. So, you know, we've gone through and had some regulation changes of late that we're trying to, uh, you know, change some of our commerce park zone areas, providing more flexibility for development for our, for our commercial property owners and our vacant property owners. And getting that word out there to the brokers and letting them know that there's, you know, that we are making those changes. Uh, we've had, you know, incorporated a lot of uh, um, um, press releases to the brokers to, you know, try to get them to, you know, to let them know that we're making these regulation changes, that we are, uh, you know, including some flexibility for retail and uh, residential development uh, within the Commerce Park Transitional Zone to help be supportive of our Village Center Zone, letting them know of our Village Center Zone plan that we're looking uh, to move forward with, 
And you know, in doing so, it's that constant communication that's spreading the word that helps change that image of East Granby over a period of time. So uh, you know, I do think that it's important. We used to do that, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, you know, through you know, we used to have local reporters that would, you know, kind of help spread that word for you. But we don't we don't have that luxury anymore. Um, you know, we have to be out there kind of tooting our own horn and doing our own marketing and getting that word out. So um, And I just would also say that as it relates, you know, we're talking about incentives tonight, but the brokers are aware and what di differentiates us to the brokers is they know that we are part of the Bradley Development Zones uh, incentive program that, that they but they feel that it's got a lot of red tape. So what they will do is present it, but they they keep moving along because they, there's um, the perception that there's red tape. And I will say that I've watched Gary have to go back and forth looking to make sure of a, of a particular prospect, whether they qualify under the zone. So it's not, it would not be as easy as East Granby having its own incentive that we would even, you know, be, that we would be able to um, decide quickly, it would be prescriptive. And um, I think that would resonate well. But that would be on top of the development zones incentives. No, it wouldn't, because there wouldn't oh, be would. we, the way it's being presented is there would not be double dipping. So in other words, the prospect wouldn't get the Bradley zone, which East Granby also has some um, costs associated with that, or an East Granby. Am I, am I no, I think it's one or, or an East, or an okay. East Granby incentive. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll be we'll get into those one or the other. All right. Um, next, well, thank you. Uh, did you already? Go yeah, ahead? I think we kind of covered the All right. the image aspect mm -hmm. of it. Okay. All right. So why incentives? I'll go over this as quick as I can. Uh, we already talked about why, but the pros. There's good pros and cons to incentives. The pros are you're going to win deals. <laughs> you know, companies will come here that wouldn't otherwise do it. The con is they already would have done it anyway. Uh, this is kind of both of the same same. Uh, two sides of the same coin, effectively. Um, I'll stick on the left for the moment. You do get to build relationships with consultants, brokers, folks like that when when you offer incentives that you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, elected officials can quantify results. When you know who's applying for incentives, what you offer, what the net benefit is, you can pre generate all sorts of reports. You know what's happening because of the incentives. You can pinpoint it and document it. And that's important um, also for marketing purposes. You know, when, when somebody comes and they take advantage of an incentive, we, we should reserve the right to use their name, their image, photographs of the uh, ribbon cutting event for all sorts of marketing um, opportunities for the town. Um, it sells a site, like I mentioned, internally through consultants, agents, and all, all the folks involved in the food chain. And it does generate tax revenue. You know, when you win a project, you do generate positive cash flow. The cons are, as I mentioned, companies very often would do this anyway, so you gotta tease that out a little bit. Community pushback is important, depending on where you are. If you remember in, in Amazon, uh, just they had won, New York City had won the Amazon uh, project, but there were politicians who said, no, we don't want this. We don't want to give any money to corporate America, to Jeff Bezos and all that. Even though technically, you know, having worked in New York State for five years, and the organization that negotiated that, they're not giving any money up front. There's lots of like, you just don't get the opportunity to tell your side when someone who's against incentives, against corporate welfare, gets out there. So you gotta be aware of that, you know? Corporate welfare is not a good thing. Um, and there are projects that fail. You know, there may be somebody who gets all this money from a state or a government, they go and build something, and then it falls through. They, they go bankrupt or they lay off people in a few years and it becomes a good story it can be quickly become a bad story, especially if, if public money is involved. Um, yeah, existing businesses feel left out. You know, you gave, <laughs> if, if you're a manufacturer of widgets and you've been in some town or location or state for, for 20 years and then the state gives all this money to a new widget manufacturer who's a competitor, makes you pretty upset. Um, that's something to look out for. And finally, uh, red tape, you mentioned, Sandra. Yeah, there's a lot of red tape. Things can be very complicated, so much so that you need a consultant to go through it. 
or hire someone on staff and it just becomes a big, a lot of incentives ultimately get orphaned because nobody just wants to go file all the paperwork, do all the fees, stay on top of it. The people who usually negotiate or obtain the incentives, after a few years they get promoted or move on to another company and the original companies there are just stuck with some folder of paperwork that needs to be filed every year and no one does it. Uh, okay. Pros and cons. So I hope to address the cons and the pros here while, while keeping the pros. Uh, our neighbors offer certain incentives. Windsor and Bloomfield both offer discretionary property tax abatements. Discretionary means you come to them hat in hand, you put your best foot forward, and you negotiate with them and they they collectively decide, whoever, the, whoever they are, powers that be, offer you an incentive based on some sliding scale very often. But it's discretionary. You have to apply for it and then get approved. That means you have to have consultants and it takes time. And there's uncertainty as to what the process is going to be like and what you're going to get. I think it'd be better if you just got rid of the discretionary aspect of it, got rid of consultants, even though this is how I put food on my table. <laughs> you know, I'm working for East Grandy here today, and, and I would say you don't want to have, an, you want the, the consultants to call you, but you don't want it to be so complex, so much red tape that it requires it. So, um, and there's some other things. The Simsbury was thinking about incentives. They're, they're working on it, uh, and, and we are as well. Maybe we'll get there before they do. Um, all right, next slide. Well, yeah. Of the two towns that you have there that are offering incentives, that's where you see the most development. I mean, you Correct. drive along Windsor and Bloomfield, and it's just factory after factory going up, warehouse going up. It's, it's just booming. You're, you're absolutely correct. And it's interesting because yeah. Windsor's gotten an, you know, an excellent reputation over the years for being developer friendly mm -hmm. by providing incentives. Uh, but as they've kind of gone along, they're political stance on that has kind of changed a little bit where they're starting to kind of pull back on that now. Um, so I, I think that that's kind of interesting as well. Though. Gary, I would say initially over time, um, Windsor was not providing incentives. Mm -hmm. And then it became unique. They started to offer some incentives. And now you may be pulling back. But originally, because they were streamlining, they streamlined the regulatory process and just how their town operated and the fact that they had all of this land, flat land, um, really good sites, mm -hmm. uh, access to the highway. They had, you know, a lot of, of good geography in their favor that they didn't need, that it was their policy not to give incentives or some other towns would. But now, as, as Gary said, it's true, now, they, now they're pulling back. And I'll explain what this means by benefits 50% over five years. So a property tax abatement is typical. Let's say you build a $1 million piece of property, real property. Um, real property, but you can't get up and walk away. So it's, it's taxed at our millage rates. Um, that would generate about a $30,000 property tax bill, give or take. Um, an abatement of 50% over five years says, well, we're gonna only tax you half of that increase. You know, instead of 30,000, we're gonna, your property tax bill will be 15,000 over the next five years. And then after that, it goes up to 100%. Um, no, no abatement. Uh, in some cases, they step it up where it's 100% uh, abatement year one, 80% abatement year two, 60% abatement year three, and so on. Uh, in New Jersey, these go out to 20 years in some cases, and um, that, that, that's what an abatement means, property tax abatement. Okay, and it doesn't include personal property. But another way of looking at it also, if nothing gets done, it's a 100% abatement in perpetuity, so yes, you that, win. You're exactly right, if somebody does not come, there's no money you generate, and there's no abatement, there's no incentive, there's no nothing. Right. Um, so this is revenue positive, is another way to look at it. You get the project, you get the uh, tax revenue, you get everything you want, you just give them a little bit of something on the front end for a few years, and then then they build it, and that'll be taxed in perpetuity. And so. Usually, and the town can still collect on personal property, we're talking real property. Right. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And by any chance, do you know what Windsor Locks or where, where Windsor Locks would fall in that? I don't. I don't. I could look into that. It'd be interesting. Um, I would think they'd offer something. Would be my guess. But however, I think Windsor is a clear winner here, just from what I've seen in the last five years. Big uptick in Bloomfield, though, too. Is there right now? Yeah. Okay. I, I, know, I know Windsor Locks is. 
you know, offered like the, the tax finance right. increments, but I don't know that I've ever heard them oh. offer any sort of abatement program, but I could be wrong. No, so. I, I think you're closer to being right, yeah. but I knew they offered the uh, TIF yep. uh, district as well. All right, I think three things go into an ideal incentive. It should be simple and easy to apply for. You don't need consultants, lawyers, or staff to, to, to negotiate this for you. Uh, it should be as of right, so you know up front what you're going to get. If I do, if I invest this much money, hire these many people, whatever, whatever the metrics are, I know what I'm going to get at the end of the day. Um, and I think for our purposes as a town, we should be able to track it. So there should be some sort of an application. We should be able to document this, who gets these incentives and who doesn't. Um, marketing, if we take advantage of it, can be really powerful. And that's really what this is, a marketing tool. Think of it more in that way. All right. So we've got two types of incentives I'd like to suggest. Uh, a commercial construction abatement is the first one. This is not for residential. It's somebody who builds new commercial space uh, or adds to existing commercial space. Any amount of at least $500,000 or more, you'll get an abatement of 50% of the increased property taxes are forgiven over a five year period and it ramps up depending on how much money you invest. And we also suggest if you're investing three to six million or more, there should be a, a permit application cost reduction as well, a discount to the permits. Uh, these are as of right. Uh, I think there should be at least a, some kind of a fee, thousand dollars, five hundred bucks, whatever. Thousand dollar fee with some sort of a simple application. Who are you? What do you plan to do? Um, just so we can we can document it. And uh, Sanders' earlier point: we don't want double dipping. You know, so you can't take this all the all the other property tax incentives that we might offer. So if it's the Bradley Airport Development Zone, great, go with that. If you want this one or the lease vacancy abatement, which we'll discuss next. You pick one. That, that's the one you get. Um, this is pretty straightforward. It's competitive with what the towns around us are offering. But I think it's even better because it's as of right. It's non-discretionary. With those, you've got to go and actually go before the town of Windsor and ask them for this and tell them how much you're paying your employees and everything. And it's You, you really don't know at the end of the day what you're going to get until you go through a three-month process. With us, they go to our website, download a one-page PDF like this, and they know exactly what they're going to get. I think that's that's really useful. Very but it good. seems like it would be developer friendly too, or because we know what it is. Right. You know, it's you know, something that's very easy to market as well. So when we're having discussions with, you know, we're talking going back to that changing the image aspect. If you want to change your image as the quote unquote small town and be that small fish in a big pond, then you know, this is kind of the way to do that, to open those discussions, to have those discussions with the broker, to really get them to understand that we're, we're, we're making a change, we're doing things differently going forward. And I think that's, you know, that's the image that we're trying to project as a team here. Uh, we're, you know, I, I've always tried to encourage people that even though we're a small town, that that's the good thing about us, is that we're a small town. You can come in and get an answer quickly you can get through the red tape, and you, you know you have assurances that that are there. So that's this is kind of modeled after that premise. Now the uh, permit discounts would mm -hmm. that actually cost the town money, or is it basically we just make less money on the permits? So there's really you know towns are kind of limited. A lot of towns do offer permits. So I know Windsor's offered uh, again as discretionary purposes they've offered a uh, reduction in, in building permit fees. So uh, anything that we take in as building permit goes back into the general fund. But so you're, it's not guaranteed income. So it, it's, it's, again, new revenue based off of it. So it's much, much the same purpose as the tax abatement. It's, it's all new to me. Okay, uh, but the town gets to keep it. We don't have to give the money to the state where a lot of the fees correct. that we collect, right. you know, we only keep a small processing fee. Yeah, the only, I mean, there is a small fee that goes on every building permit that, you know, that goes, that uh, gets charged for education purposes or whatever, but it would be, you know, 15% off of that, uh, the overall permit fee. And the permit fee is basically based on the price of the project anyway, so. There, the well, the project, for new construction, there is an actual, uh, there's an actual form that you have to fill out that, because uh, we were finding that people were putting down 
kind of bogus estimated cost of construction. So there's an actual uh, market value form that gets approved every July based off a of construction type. So when, when a developer comes in with under new construction and based off a of use group and type of construction uh, and square footage, there's a certain uh, multiplier effect. Okay. These, go ahead. This is a list of the most recent projects that we've had. Um, so since 2008, we have a database system. So this is, uh, you know, obviously we don't know what if we had the incentive package put in place, what, you know, what, how that would have increased this or decreased this, but it can at least give you some real numbers of capital investment, you know, from 2008 to 2020, some of the, some of the dollars that we've seen. And as you can tell, quickly taking a look at this, uh, you know, none of our, none of the capital, of, you know, improvement dollars, investment dollars have gone over 2.4 million dollars. Um, but although, you know, if you go back to the tax abatement schedule, we do have, you know, again tiered levels up to six million dollars. So um, we have 11 projects that were that would have been approved if we had had this tax abatement program that would have been approved under the 500 thousand uh, dollar tax abatement program and three projects that would have been approved at the $1.5 million level. So it's just, but again, keeping in mind, the last column kind of shows you, differentiates in uh, new, build, new construction versus additions. So in, in a building that's being fully constructed, that's obviously, you know, all the revenue will be abated for that five year period. Whereas in an addition, like uh, New Fern putting in a 20,000 square foot addition, they're only they're getting the abatement on the new new property taxes or the increased assessment over a five-year period based off of the addition itself. So we just wanted to make that clear. Adam, do you have anything? Yeah, uh, I would just say you know most of these would have qualified for at least the, the five hundred thousand dollar bracket. A few, uh, two of three, three would have qualified for the one point five million. Yep. And none of them for the three or six million. But so some of the customers or some of the uh, projects actually took the uh, state projects or state uh, abatement, right? Well, they, uh, I'm sure, right? The, the uh, they the new, firm, new firm qualified for the manufacturing abatement. Now that would have been so. What they're going to do in that particular instance is they're going to take whatever you know. So you could system. offer it, now the the Bradley Development Zone is only offered for um, manufacturing companies essentially qualify under the, mm -hmm. uh, the Nexus codes. Um, so, you know, if they can get a larger abatement increase, so when you're looking at some of the percentages that you have here, we only offer a 65% abatement. So if you have a manufacturing company that's coming into town, they can still qualify for the Bradley Development Zone. Now, under the, the way the program guidelines are written now, the Bradley Development Zone, as you know, is a 40% abatement from the town, and the 40% is supposed to be paid back from the state most years. Um, so, uh, you know, it may be, it may make some sense, you know, if it is a manufacturing company coming into town to try to apply for that program. But again, as we noted here, that the, you know, you couldn't get the new commercial construction on top of it. So there is no, you know, there would, you wouldn't be allowed, you know, to double dip by any means. So you qualify for one or the other? Exactly. Right. So you're not going to get an 80% abatement and then on top of it get a 65% you know, abatement or you know, be able to apply for that again after that. It's one or the other. Right. But we just wanted to give you guys a sense of some of the projects that we've had, some dollar amounts. Now what we're hoping for is with this program, we, you know, we do have some parcels that are large enough, you know, the 130 acre parcel behind the Route 20 Plaza certainly, you know, could support, you know, buildings. We, we allow buildings to be constructed up to 300,000 square feet. So certainly, you know, you could get into that $6 million range of capital investment or that $3 million range. So even though we haven't had a project like that, it doesn't mean that we couldn't entice one. Um, and that's, that's, where, that's where you see with the, you know, the increase of capital investment, it, you know, that extra benefit of the reduction in permits, I think, is something that helps out. And that is something that a, a, a lot of towns do for a large large capital investment dollars that are invested in, uh, you know, industrial development in the area. So, But having it be prescriptive, 
I think is something that does help set us apart from the rest. Yeah, I do like that. It takes the politics out of it too, you know, and it's also something, you know, we'll get into this a little bit more, but this is really market driven. I mean, we, we, we took a close look at what the existing market is and implemented it. It doesn't mean that you can't from year to year take a look at it, change it, and make adjustments to it, you know, according to those market uh, circumstances. All right, uh, let me start with Two Gateway. Two Gateway has been, it's our only commercial Class A office space that we have. It's over three years now, it's been vacant. Um, when I worked for the state of New York, I saw millions of square feet of vacant space left over by Kodak and IBM, and they were very, very difficult. You know, I saw many private equity firms that come in, buy one. Uh, there's an IBM plant in Fishkill that they bought, and uh, they, they thought they were going to get a tenant in. They didn't. They stopped heating it in the winter, stopped cooling it in the summer. Go there a couple years later with a potential client. You see that uh, some deer in rut had run into the windows and smashed them all in. Uh, you see insulation falling in from the ceilings because of uh, condensation, because they didn't uh, keep the temperatures right. And, you know, they stopped paying taxes, just the dilapidated buildings. If you leave something vacant too long, it, even the owners don't put money into it. They stop paying taxes. I, I would hate to see that happen to, to Two Gateway. And we've been there, I've been there a couple of times now. Um, it's, it's not moving and based on, based on the fact that we, you know, working from home is becoming a bigger deal and people can work and live anywhere. You know, I see a lot of people who can on, on my Twitter account, they're all going out to like out west, to Florida, wherever they want to go and they'll just set up an office. So it may be hard to fill this space. So Gary thought of, you know, and, and a few folks actually, but Gary mostly is like, well, we've got a hole here. What if you have, what do we do for tenants? How do we incentivize somebody to come and take space at Two Gateway, for example, or any other place that's vacant, been vacant for a while? So I thought we would have, offer a commercial um, lease vacancy abatement. Now this would cost us money. The idea of it would be this. Uh, two Gateway, I think the property tax is around 30000 a year. If somebody were to come in and say, I'll take half of Two Gateway and, and put 100 employees in and, and, and take, the, take the space, as long as it's a five-year lease, we propose, if they're doing a triple net lease or if it's just to the landlord, that we would offer them an abatement of 100% of their property taxes for that prorated portion of the, you know, so it'd be $15,000 a year of no, of lost revenue for five years. In return, we get a five-year lease, somebody taking the site. They would probably put in personal property, you know, computers, equipment, that kind of thing. We would tax that, but this is a, that this program is basically targeting, really you'll see the next slide, two, maybe, maybe three properties in town. Two gateway, one other one. The idea being if you've had a vacant space, at least 15,000 square feet, it's been vacant for over a year, and you do get a new tenant to come in, they take 15,000 square feet or more, and they sign a five-year lease, you get an abatement of 50%, prorated to the amount of taxes they would have paid under a triple net lease. Um, and if you've got a piece of property that's been vacant for three years or more, we suggest uh, an abatement of 100% for five years. Um, same thing, as of right, you can't take it with any of the other incentives. A thousand dollar application fee. Uh, personal property is not included, so there would be some increased revenue there to offset this. Um, and, and I suggest perhaps we renew this each year if we decide to do this, to at least come back and take a look at it, see if this is working. If not, we can edit it or, uh, or do what we want. Um, so in your particular example, uh, you know, we as a town would give up $75,000 worth of projected revenue, but we'd have a building with 100 employees and some personal property, but we'd have a building that uh, was working as opposed to being vacant. Yes, and you'd have people visiting the, the, lunch, the lunch restaurants, which you know they're going to do, uh, the gas stations. Um, Probably, I would imagine you get 100 people working here, someone's going to want to live in town, um, and they're going to buy the property and... And improve $30,000. It's $30,000. For the entire building. So say, say you had a tenant that came in that moved into the entire building, 
you would then abate the 100% of it. Right, so that's 150. And, and that, I was just using your right, example. For the, sure. Yes, for the, uh, the yeah, fire. Fifth, half the building was taken yeah. 15 times. So 75, five. there you go. That's right. That's correct. That's, that's correct. So, so yeah, 75,000 over five years. Uh, but it would be taken, and I think we would stop a downward spiral of what could potentially become something that we did. Like an old vacant mall that we have that's just an outdated right. building, right. you know. Yeah. So, I, well, I think it's a really interesting idea. So, just to go back to the other one real quick, the, the important part to realize about the, the co commercial construction abatement is it, it was important to us to not only incentivize new construction, but also our existing company. So if you go back to the, one of the cons that was mentioned earlier, what are we doing for our existing and expanding companies? We want to make sure that we're, we're addressing them too. So if they're expanding the barns, aerospaces, the world, and you know, rather than having them expand and, or need, need to expand and go somewhere else, we want them to be able to expand and grow here. So you know we're trying to we're trying to provide an abatement all you know for new construction and our existing uh, you know you know additions and uh, expansions as well. May I also say I'm not aware of any town in our region anyway. I'm not aware of any town that's doing this right now for um, related to vacancy, and I do think that that would differentiate us. It, and, and we have some reason to bring some folks out to come take a look at the property. The commercial lease vacancy abatement kind of goes back to the point that I brought up last time is that this is really market design. So what we're seeing in the market is that there's an oversaturation of, of Class A office in the market right now. So the three plus years, you know, most of our, we're, we're not having a vacancy issue with our flex and industrial spaces. So, um, when you take a look at this slide here, I, you know, I quickly went on like GroupNet and Search Site Finder just to see, well, what do we have available in East Granby right now that has 15,000 square feet or more? And uh, the flex industrial and manufacturing spaces, warehouse spaces, things of that nature, those are getting leased up. The cost of construction is so high that you know companies are moving into those existing spaces. So. Right now, with not having a vacancy issue, if we had a vacancy issue, we probably wouldn't be proposing what we're proposing to. But because we're not having a vacancy issue in those areas, we don't, we don't think a lot of those occupants are necessarily going to run into the position where they've been vacant for a year. Uh, so we don't necessarily think. But if they are, you do have you know the ability to offer them a you know one year, and we cut down the number of years for you know three years for a fifty percent abatement to try to, to help that along if there was something. But the one that we're really truly trying to incentivize and kind of set ourselves apart, obviously, is the, the three plus years, the Class A office. You know, how can we, you know, how can we set this apart from the 20 buildings that are the same size in Windsor that are, are, are on the market right now as well? So we're trying to, you know, work with that and provide something a little unique in that regards. So what you see here available right now in the town of East Granby of 15,000 square feet, you have two Gateway Boulevard, that's a 55,000 square foot office building. Uh, it's been vacant for approximately three years now. You have 7 to 17 Bradley Park Road. Um, Allstate used to uh, lease these buildings for uh, records retention. And they've been vacant for approximately a year, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but we've actually had several calls and worked with the broker. There's, there is definitely interest in the property. It's a matter of, it, it is a, a little bit of a unique site because of the buildings and the parking lot configuration, but they've, uh, you know, they've had a lot of interest in that property. And the last one, I did note it, it's new construction. It's just been built. That's the reason why the this, this space hasn't necessarily been filled. Um, so they could potentially qualify for the, the new construction abatement under the new program. But if they had, you know, five years down the road, say it was still vacant, you know, they and they still had this listing on there, they would be, you know, have a potential for applying for that abatement as well. So that's it. We'll just leave you with this slide for the moment. Again, we're not trying to change the economics of the economy or our business. What we're trying to do is use incentives to market the the town and our sites. 
and they get on the radar of all the folks who are in the industry who are paid to find incentives wherever they can. And so that will put us into the group of we've got incentives, and I think we're going to get more calls, more emails like the ones that you know I presented there. And Gary, I think you got one even last week or a few days ago. Yeah, I think incentives. the you know I think the idea is to get on uh, you know with, uh, actually 67 Nicholson. We had a company that was looking to relocate in the area. They're coming from Farmington, a medical pharmacy company. They really wanted to. They had heard uh, and. Our brokers are, are marketing the Bradley Development Zone. They were curious that if they could qualify under that program. Uh, being a pharmacy, they're not necessarily a manufacturer, but I said, let me let me double check. You know, it, it's a fairly simple process going through DECD, but there is some red tape having to obviously go through the state agency. Um, and, you know, we contact them. We did finally, uh, you know, make contact with them. But, you know, again, interestingly enough, it was important to them that there was an incentive involved. They were looking at another surrounding community in East Windsor that doesn't necessarily offer for an incentive. And just being able to make that short list was enough to differentiate us between you know, a different property. Um, so I think that's where this slide you know, becomes more important is that, you know, that right hand side of that decision process. So we have something that's marketable, that's as of right, that we can put out there that's easy to follow. Uh, that, that puts us at a, a much greater advantage, we believe, and gives us something that we can work with our commercial brokers to help our vacant property owners develop their properties. And I think between that and some of the you know flexibility that we've we've designed in our regulation changes to allow for our property owners to to do that, I think is you know something exciting for East Granby. Now the percentages that you had there in abatements in a number of years, is that something that the EDC has come up with or is, is that? Uh, that's something that we, yeah, that's something that we reviewed with the EDC. Uh, you know, we looked at a couple different variations and, uh, you know, ultimately this is what we came up with as a, you know. And it's comparable to what other neighborhoods are doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of them are structured a little bit differently, like Adam said. You know, some of them are just a flat abatement for a certain year. Some of them are tiered, you know, break, you know, going downward. Um, some of them are based off a of capital investment like this. That seems to be most typical. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think it's a good idea to have something that isn't going to change, you know, where, I mean, businesses like to have an understanding of what their future benefit or future cost is. They'd like to see fixed things. So you walk in and you got the package, you know, or the discussion, or you even click it on the screen, and you see that, so you say, okay, that can get your interest, and then you can start. So I think that that certainly is fine. The, I'll trust, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, our economic development team here on, uh, on recommendation regarding the abatement. Uh, percent because you know what's in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I uh, The other thing that I really like is I like, to me, it's a little bit of a different viewpoint on the vacancies and I really like that. And if we could support our, our business owners, our landowners right. uh, with with something that, you know, and like you say, you know, maybe the old Oshkosh building has been empty for three years and, they, you know, this one, but there's not a lot. Right. But if we could get, you know, you know, I'd love to have 250, 300 uh, more in, uh, folks in town mm -hmm. working who decide to, you know, spend money in, in East Granby. But like you mentioned, I think you get more than one person that decides to live in East Granby. Right. I think people want to live and work in their community, so. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I guess my only comment would be I've always felt businesses go where they're wanted. Mm -hmm. This says we want you. That's yes. exactly right. And that, and like I said, I, that's the important aspect of this. I think uh, you guys know as well that you know over the last uh, probably two or three years now we've been you know investing in a, a part-time consultant as working with the Economic Development uh, Commission, really to try to emphasize economic development and the importance of it, and trying to change that image. And uh, you know I think with the team that we assembled, uh, you know although it's on a part-time basis. I think they both have their their strengths, but I think it's you know we've been able to kind of come up with a you know a program that we think could help differentiate ourselves 
Well, we, it's also important to us to keep that small town aspect because I think that that is something genuine that we can offer. Um, you know, I, I love having you know opportunities talking with you know prospective uh, you know businesses that are coming into town and being able to treat them like a real person and you know being you know having that small town component and having something like this that's you know easy to follow easy to offer I think is going to set us apart from particularly the, the surrounding towns in the area and uh, you know with Sandra and you know allowing uh, Adam the chance to kind of market that with the commercial brokers uh, you know and it's one of those things that we can you know kind of see as it goes you know like Adam said you track it and uh, you, know, you keep an eye on the market. If we're seeing a huge change in vacancy rates, and we have a concern about the vacancy abatement program, then we change it. You know, I mean, you you, you identify that, and you make it, you make the necessary changes to the market. Yeah, currently, the uh, I don't think there's any ordinance or anything, but by statute, we there's a board of selectmen on an individual basis where somebody comes in to talk to to mm -hmm. community development, and then it gets to us. We could vote on an abatement, but I like the idea that it's right here. You can mark, you folks can market it, and they know what it is. It's a known quantity, and it's not us having to have a special meeting or a discussion every time. It's the process is there. So I think it's that, awfully hard to sell that. You know, when you don't really know what it is, and yeah, you'd have to go before the board of selectmen. That's, that's yeah. some of the that's some of the difficulties that I, that I'm seeing with other towns. They have change your leadership and a different sure. a different perspective kind of coming in and now all of a sudden they're you know everybody wants to reinvent the wheel well you know i think if you have that that process prescriptive and you take away that discretionary aspect ahead of time now is our chance to have that discretionary aspect and, and implement the plan and then like i said you you react to the market you make the changes necessary that you have to along the way yeah, once we have an ordinance that says that we have the authority to do it, the Board of Selectmen could tweak it. Or right, anything. exactly. That would be my suggestion is to sit down with the town attorney, let them know what it is that we're trying to do, make a formal presentation to the Board of Finance, and uh, ultimately, you know, enact a change in the ordinances that would help. You know. How often would you guys recommend that this be looked at? Once a year, once every two years, once every three years? I think it's something that should be evaluated once every year on an you know at least on a you know an informal basis I think uh, you know I, I would suggest that the ED you know our economic development staff make you know a yearly presentation to the board of selectmen um, you know just, a, just as kind of an update yeah. you know uh, on, on, on an annual basis letting you know how things are going mm -hmm. and you know it could be a quick uh, you know update hey this is you know this is how many abatements we've approved this is what we're seeing these are the market trends that we're seeing. I think the, you know, the one thing that you're going to have to keep an eye on from a market-driven perspective is that vacancy abatement, right? Because that that's the market that can change substantially. Now, I don't see any changes coming down the road. If anything, you know, the office environment is probably going to be more saturated as you have more, you know, more businesses downsizing, working from home, things of that nature. So, again, this is a, you know, that that's just increasing the. <coughs> vacancy of being in the program. But, uh, you know, that's something that we need to keep a, a pulse on and need to, you know, work with our commercial brokers, have Sandra talking with them, you know, identifying the needs. So. The only one thing I can see is that one vacancy abatement might leave a bad taste in some other, you know, leaseors, miles seeing that someone else is getting yeah. no taxes. It, it, admittedly, that's it's almost like it's targeted on one specific uh, well it's property. it is size specific so it's not necessarily targeted for one it is designed to provide a higher incentive for somebody that has that's been vacant for three years but mm -hmm. it's not to say that you know i mean there couldn't be an industrial property that's mm -hmm. vacant for three years either right i mean are we going to require the landowner or the property owner to put some sort of money into marketing it or something you know so it's not just a town that's giving money away versus the actual landlord has some skin in the game to... Well, yeah. one of the reasons why we thought this was important was because even looking at something like 67 Nicholson, a uh, newly constructed building, you know, the property owner would, you know, obviously, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, once a building's been constructed, 
on the individual, you know, if you're having difficulty, you know, um, implementing it, uh, kind of modeled it a little bit, but tweaked it off of the Bradley Development Zone. The Bradley Development Zone does allow for a vacant company if they've been vacant for a year to apply um, under, under their program. So that was kind of the basis of this. But again, it was market driven from the standpoint of the, the need of, you know, we just, what we're trying to point out is although this is somewhat revenue negative from a standpoint, mm -hmm. although you're gonna get an increase in personal property taxes, um, you're not going to have the same need for it, the industrial, but that's just because that's what the market's showing you. Mm -hmm. Cost of construction could go down tomorrow, and now there's going to be, you know, maybe the vacancy rates go up because it's cheaper to build your building rather than than, than you lease your building. So, you know, that's the reason that I think it's important that we kind of keep an eye on it. It would be interesting to have some type of an idea how much the personal property taxes were for stuff up. Yeah, I was just about to say that. It's like, how much did we really lose when they left? So how if, much would we get back if it's leased again? So you may saying, not be losing the, uh, the building. It may not be revenue, the, revenue negative. Right? The, uh, the building tax was in, you know, was in the $40,000 range, and the personal property was in uh, about the same. Okay, so oh, well. in essence, so you didn't lose anything. Negative. Right. You know, in that particular. Often, that's the other good thing about office uses is you usually get a, a, a pretty high personal property tax revenue aspect to it. So th I do think it would have a balancing effect, at least at least half. And it's not exempt like machinery is. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And if right. if you did find it going the other way, I mean, there, you could potentially think about abating the personal property tax as opposed to. It could. That brings up clawbacks. We were thinking of putting a clawback on this. I, I didn't remember to put it on this slide, this version, but, you know, the idea is you have to have a five-year lease. And what if the tenant just picks up their bags and moves right. to Springfield in year yeah. three? Um, obviously, you stop. <laughs> you're no longer providing the abatement. Of my property taxes go right back up. We would want some sort of a clawback here. Or you could ask for it. I don't know if you'd ever get the money back. Like, is it really collectible if they leave? If a company goes out of business, it's not. Uh, if they leave town and go somewhere else, maybe. Um, but and, I the, the, and I spend the fifty thousand dollars in lawyer fees. But does, yeah. the abate, does the abatement go to the uh, leaser or to the uh, whoever land, pays the property? My idea would be this: whoever's paying the property taxes. Typically, if it's a triple net lease. You know, it's the tenant who's going to pay property taxes and who gets it directly. But even this, is standard, gross. this would go, you know, if you're not paying a triple net lease and the landlord is paying it through their taxes, then the landlord gets the, the property tax abatement. Right. Then you can put a lien on it if he doesn't, you know, pay. Ah, uh, that's, that's that's an interesting, interesting point. Versus, that's interesting. Yeah. versus, you know, a tenant leaves, there's nothing to lien. That is right. a good point. Yeah, if the if this goes passes through to the tenant. You're absolutely right. We go after the tenant for the clawback. That's a but if it's going to the landlord, the landlord maybe is trying to pocket some of this. I don't know. I mean, you you market this free and clear. Everyone knows. If you're a tenant, you know you're not paying property taxes, even if what's going to happen is if you adopt something like this, and we let the brokers know, they're gonna they're gonna use that as a marketing tool to help differentiate them between the other. Again, there's such an oversaturation in the market for for the office uses that uh, they would, you know, they would use that to market the property to kind of set them apart, and they would build that into the lease agreement essentially. Uh, that that would benefit would be passed on to the, 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 the tenant. But in a gross lease, it's all factored in. What you know, what all of the utilities would be. I mean, it's, with, this would be gross lease. And um, it would all be factored in, so the taxes would be part of that. So it should be part of their pro forma to have I'll, that reflect. I'll throw this out, just one thought. I would prefer no clawbacks, just because it scares people from committing up front. And it, it you know, are you really going to claw back and put the lien on? You could, but a landlord might go, well, I'm not sure. Like, it's been three years, I'm desperate. I'll take anybody who's got a pulse and will give you some money. Fine, come in here, and you know as a landlord that the credibility, of the, you know, maybe this is a risky tenant, and if they go bankrupt or leave in three years, 
they are now longer. At that point, they're left with vacant space again and an assessment, a, a clawback bill. We, we might want to think about that a little. I, I just throw that out as a, but I may be vetoed. I know, you know, <laughs> others, others that I've Well, we certainly would about. like our team to take a look at that. And fair and enough, fair but, enough. But if like someone leaves the year two out of a five year lease, they don't continue getting the No, payments. absolutely not. Okay. You stop right away, and no more instant, abatement. Right. Right. Your full property taxes. The question is, do you start pursuing them across state lines, right. or through bankruptcy court? Yeah, or it, it becomes your choice how far you right. how right. far you want to go. With it's it. going to cost more than. Yeah, yeah, it ends up it ends up being cost prohibitive because, like you said, you know, going to court over it, and, you know, you just stop it from going forward. I think at that point. Yeah, um, but you're writing up a really good point. So let's. Chat about how to well, you certainly, if uh, if you folks could, uh, you know, take a look at those, make any tweaks that you want to make, uh, uh, we will have this on our upcoming agendas so that we can talk about it, have any questions, give you feedback, uh, and then at the same time, I'll simultaneously, I'll I'll start a track with the town attorney to see what it is that we need to do to make something like this happen. And uh, then we'll take it from there. But I, I, um, I, I see some creative ideas here, and I really uh, am pleased uh, with the presentation. So thanks so much for that. And uh, we all, you know, all of us in the room want to continue to have East Granby grow. And if this is a way that we can do that in a certain segment, then that's terrific. And let's go ahead and do it. And I don't mind giving up five years if I got. 15 more years coming on the back end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're not giving it all up anyway, yeah. except for the vacancy. And it's all new money. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, from a town standpoint, that you're not at a loss. If the town's not at a loss, it's all new money. Right. How long do you think it would take to implement something like this in our town? Well, I think, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to you know, say without further research or anything, but I mean, I can see um, us being able to get this done before the end of the year. Well, it could also be counterproductive if we don't begin to implement this relatively soon, because if someone's thinking, they're going to say, well, geez, let me see how this pans out a little bit. You, you don't yeah. want it to deter. But I mean, I could see this going to an October or November town meeting. Yeah. It's a healthy conversation. It's a good conversation, and we definitely want to pursue it. I would petition to have it um, looked at as soon as possible. Yes. Because as soon as, you know, for instance, as soon as September comes, there'll be a little hiatus for the summer. But as soon as uh, September comes and everything ramps up, and it at least would allow um, on the vacancy side, specifically on the vacancy side, to be able to see what can be done. Well, and I agree that there is a concern that if we don't, you know, if we are looking at it seriously, and I think we are, if we're looking at it seriously, and then you know you're going to say that you know to a broker, and the broker's going to say, you know, if you're still around three months from now, the company is Granby. Well, we want them to come now. So you're right. The <laughs> speed speed is of the essence. Yes. So, okay. Good. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Really so what's next? It. You guys are doing something next week in this thing, or is the town, or are you doing something next? Uh, the week? next steps are for the uh, for the team to. Uh, further tweak and make any additional recommendations. I'm working with the town attorney so that we can go forward. So we, I think, I think all three of us are agreed that this is something that makes sense. Let's see how it should uh, formulate and let's get it done as soon as we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Gary, why don't you stay for the, uh, the other handout that you gave us? Yep. The, uh, so, um, I, Many thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, the next order of business is consider and act upon FY21 and 22 capital items. The first uh, capital item uh, on the list is the Village Center concept plan, uh, where we're looking to issue an RFP based on the attached uh, specifications, and that is actually the sheet that Gary handed you out. It was in your package. Um, and we're uh, asking the capital request of $20,000, uh, which uh, would be combined with uh, $20,000 uh, from the operating budget. So we'd have at least $40,000 to put towards the village center plan. Gary, you want to walk us through this? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've been working fairly hard with the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, implementing some regulation changes in lieu of this uh, or prior to. Um, we 
recently went through and made some adoptions to the village center zone regulations as well as adopting the commerce park transitional zone which is uh, the area surrounding our village center zone uh, in doing so one of the one of the goals in that was to increase a little bit of housing density in and around the area to help make the village center uh, more economically viable uh, we have a good daytime population with our local businesses in and around the area for lunch and, and things of that nature to help support the local businesses during the daytime. Uh, we have a good traffic count, um, good, um, you know, going through on Route 20, 30 to, you know, 18,000 to 30,000 vehicles, depending on the, you know, the area of uh, Route 20 that you're talking about. Um, and one of the things that we'd like to do is really, you know, is, is the next step is to make, you know, one of our goals in the plan of conservation development is to make the village center economic, uh, economically viable. And by doing so, we think um, adopting a village center plan and working with a, a design consultant that will put together a plan that will not only, you know, set uh, some visual goals for the, the village center from a design perspective, but will help uh, uh, design, create public spaces, uh, and create public infrastructure projects that'll help with connectivity, uh, streetscape designs, things of that nature, um, to make recommendations uh, and come up with a construction sequencing plan that we can follow uh, into the future uh, for developing the public infrastructure projects. And I think what a, the exciting opportunity is, once you start to define that vision and start to create some of those spaces, there's a lot of connectivity that I think can happen. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I watch people walk through, uh, you know, even, you know, the simple path that we put, you know, had DOT put up by Algro School. And I watch the people that walk through during lunchtime just to walk on the path. Um, you know, I think once we start looking at, you know, our village center area and designing those public spaces will start to provide some not only a vision some aesthetics but you know a reason or identity for the village center zone itself and i think one of the goals is to you know help help ensure that we have you know that we kind of transition from that bedroom community that convenience oriented environment that we increase that nighttime and weekend population as well and help support our local businesses by you know increasing a little bit of the density in and around the village center area getting feet on the ground giving people a reason to kind of come into the center um, you know so things like uh, you know maybe designing parks and uh, you know streetscapes that you know making uh, giving recommendations for making the village center more attractive and having some continuity and then much like we did with our, our manufacturing companies you know and, and the work with the Economic Development Commission, we'd like to, and we started some of this work already, working with our local retailers and having a merchant group and really getting them involved in that process as well. I can see that as a, a second step to this. So I think it, this is, a, you know, kind of an important next step for us, um, you know, as we, you know, have kind of, you know, we're working on completing some of those regulation changes that will help provide some of the, you know, the support to, um, that, that was important to you know adopt this master concept plan that we're looking at. So if you guys have any questions, yeah, I do. Um, when you were talking about someone coming in and, and the design and, and that type of thing, um, did you plan on having this person identify any potential catalysts to help the village center? take off catalyst meaning identify uh, things possibly even beyond the scope of what our plan of conservation and development has or what's been discussed mm -hmm. just to have them bring a fresh point of view and say yep. you know one thing that may be needed in this area is this and we've seen other regions that that uh, did that and it ended up being able to provide you know a uh, People built around it. People did things around it, and so on. Um, sure. And that, I refer to a catalyst as something that could be identified that would really help launch the village. Uh, yeah, I think that's the goal. I, you know, when you have that design, you know, design consultant or towns go through that process. Simsbury went through that process with Iron Horse Boulevard. 
Um, we have kind of a similar, you know, I, I explained to people, we have a similar structure uh, at Simsbury with Route 10 uh, and Route 20. And you have, you know, you know, in Simsbury you have Route 10 and Iron Horse Boulevard. And in East Granby we have Route 20 and, and school, school Street. We always looked at School Street as the potential of having that kind of Main Street development off of Main Street. You know, we have a nice, beautiful uh, government campus here uh, in, the, in the center, but it's a little bit underutilized. There's not a lot of connectivity, um, you know, and I think the idea is how do we get people, you know, into the center, uh, not just shopping centers, right, that we're, we're stopping by, not just convenient shopping where it's a little bit more of a destination. And we can do that by creating public spaces, parks, maybe an amphitheater. I, you know, these are ideas that, uh, you know, we would take a, we would have the designer take a look at what those opportunities are. So they're gonna take a look at the existing land uses that are there, and they're gonna start to make recommendations to what we could do to not only dress up the aesthetics, but create those public spaces that'll help bring people you know, give people a reason to, to walk in and around. And we actually have a water feature here on the town campus. I mean, yep. we've got, we've got uh, in the back this community center, you give some, <laughs> some weeks you can walk on it. I was just going to say. But, 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 the, but the flip side of that is what you do is, you know, you do whatever you need to do to aerate it. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, have some sidewalks and you have some other things and all of a sudden you have a catalyst that, yeah. you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that whoever the consultant is, um, you know, has the opportunity to bring in some fresh ideas and that we wouldn't... Yeah, come the, come the end of August, the beginning of September, our goal would be is to put together an RFP that would help, you know, kind of flush that out a little bit more and describe that. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's what we're looking for is somebody to, you know, take their imagination and creativity and, and you know, kind of you know, and you're going to be able to when you you know through that RFP process, you're going to be able to see projects that they've worked on or done yes. in the past, and be able to kind of say, okay, well, I, I can see where this is going. A lot of them are simple. You know, uh, it's a walkability. You know, there's going to be a lot of streetscape projects, walkability, sidewalks. Uh, a lot of recommendations that are made are like putting utilities underneath the ground, and then you have to take all those improvements that you're making within the, the public infrastructure. Now we have to come up with like a construction phasing plan that's going to, you know, so we can then go into the future and say, okay, well, how, how are we gonna pay for this? You know, can we, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we could phase this through a construction phasing plan u utilizing steep grants in the future or some sort of economic viability grants that may help, uh, you know, develop our, our village center areas and provide, uh, you know, support to help make the village center economically viable. So, and do some traffic calming on, on twenty. Uh, that one's gonna. That one's always a difficult one because DOT is very tough. But the good thing is, is that it starts those conversations. So that is definitely a goal. Um, you know, we started some of that process. I, I, obviously, our, our former first selectman Dave Kilbon was successful in you know convincing the DOT to to put in some improvements when they're uh, reconstructing Route 20. But I do think that there are definitely some uh, traffic calming aspects that they can take a look at. And connectivity, I mean, uh, we just recently approved uh, Bill Wilson's project last night, and he's talking about going forward with some of the development on mm -hmm. East Street. How can, we convince, how can we convince people to cross that intersection? Um, you know, it's always been a long dream of mine of taking School Street and potentially extending it into uh, the East Street uh, intersection so it's at the lighted intersection uh, that would help stop some of the cross traffic or you know that we see that you know from uh, actually c coming into work today one of the uh, dump trucks was coming down school street because their gps tells them hey don't go, don't don't go all the way down to the light let's go down uh, school street uh, instead so i think as you develop that as main street you make that a little bit more cumbersome the geometry and it becomes more of a public space uh, it, the hard part in, for the designer is going to be able to create those, um, you know, those public spaces that you need. And that's what helps bring people out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we have, you know, wonderful opportunities here with some of the green spaces that we try to utilize for our parades and even our summer concerts. Maybe there's a need, you know, or desire to put in a, an amphitheater. Maybe we can look at uh, the connectivity between 
um, say the 130 acre parcel you know I think it would be exciting if we had you know uh, Connecticut South Drive I always envision you know the, the industrial area if you had a uh, a connection to the you know Connecticut South Drive. Those people during lunch p potentially could walk over to Three Brothers and grab a bite to eat during lunch or after work or uh, you know things of that nature. So I think uh, you, know, you know that would be kind of the exciting opportunity. But I think it, we're going to have to take a uh, you know that's going to be the the charge of the designers is really to kind of take a look at those existing land uses and where are the opportunities to kind of create those public spaces. It's a very um, unique and interesting. Uh, project, as you know, over on Main Street in Windsor Locks, and mm -hmm. it was really interesting to see how that got started and how it progressed in the years and effort and so on. Um, if there was some way to capture some of their experiences to aid here, that would be uh, beneficial because they've learned a lot over the 10, 15 years that they've been involved in that. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, we have a good, obviously, a good working relationship with them because we work with them through the Bradley Development League, so we're in constant contact with them. So, I only got like one worry. Without a catalyst, we're going to have the exact same thing as we did from the '70s. We had a grandiose plan, and nothing came of it. I well, just don't want to see the same thing. thing again. Locks. When we did the study, um, we were quite surprised when they came in and uh, suggested moving the train station from South Main Street back to the center of town because everybody thought that was off the table. Once they moved it, it would never come back. But they you know, were pretty persistent at, at recommending that and it's taken 15 years. Right. But in the meantime, knowing that that train station is coming back to the center of town, the Montgomery building was renovated so that catalyst that was identified was right. vital in all of the other activities um, anticipating that to take place. So I agree with you, identifying the catalysts, and it could be something really simple here. For example, in the plan of conservation and development meetings, uh, one person came in and recommended a bus stop. You know, you start doing things that bring people in and make that a focal point. People want to build around it. People want to open their store or provide services and that type of thing. So I think the catalyst is extremely important as well. The, the other so thing that... The uh, are helpful. Somebody like Windsor Locks with the Montgomery building and then certainly the, the train station relocation, that, you know, that becomes exciting and enticing new businesses to come in. Exactly. Uh, because, they, you know, now you, you have what you believe to be more, you know, patrons that are going to come to your local businesses. Um, you know, and again, that's kind of why I mentioned the, the daytime and nighttime population. I think East Granby does a really good job with their daytime population because of the surrounding businesses. But you know, when you drive through on the the weekend, a lot of times the you know the, the shopping centers are are, are empty. Um, you know, so I think uh, having people in and around that, and some of the changes that we made to our regulations to allow for you know ground floor apartments in our village center zone. Uh, things of that nature, I think, are, are helpful. Uh, you look at Simsbury with, with Iron Horse Boulevard, one of the problems that they've had is, you know, the development on Route 10 versus Iron Horse Boulevard is completely different. Uh, so allowing that housing component, how can, you, how can you allow a housing component to help kind of supplement and increase and provide for the retail development as well? The, uh, the other thing that I was thinking is, and we were having this conversation, is, you know, it takes courage of convictions, well, it takes a plan, it takes courage of conviction, and it takes patience. Uh, you know, those of us that have been in town for 20 plus years know that on International Drive, uh, it was paved and there was lights and there was the islands and the trees and there wasn't anything past Pepsi. So, you know, you, you do have to provide, whether it's a catalyst or whether in this case, infrastructure, you've got to provide those things that will nurture the development that you want. So. Yeah, that plan is, from my perspective, very important. So uh, I agree with it. And I think it's helpful. I think especially from a, a public infrastructure perspective, if you can get a set of recommendations 
on some improvements that would make some sense going forward and creating some of those public spaces. I think that would help a lot of our local businesses in and around the area. I have a, actually a meeting tomorrow. Um, we have interest in the, the Gorko properties uh, that have been on the market for quite some time. So, you know, uh, you know, talking to local property owners, letting them know, hey, that, you know, these, these are things that we have coming down the road with the Village Center Zone. Uh, you know, being able to point to a plan saying, you know, this is, this is what we're trying to do and what, where we're trying to grow will help uh, kind of increase their potential. Speaking of like public spaces, you know, we we're talking about that green swap there. That would be a perfect project for like the Hartford Foundation grant. That would benefit everybody, but I don't know who would, uh, you know, spearhead it. Well, we'd have I mean, to get the next, it's, right. it's, uh, it's almost June 15th, so like we'd have to get the, the next round or, or, or something else that we could look for for right. grants or something like that. But I wouldn't want to do a significant investment in that area without having a master plan, and that's what this is all about. I think, I think that helps with the connectivity and the imagination and once you start giving a reason for people to walk between one place or the other, you'll be surprised. Uh, you know, I mean, we, again, I point towards the, you know, the, the sidewalk to nowhere on Route 20. People will, you know, spend their lunch and walk over from the medical there's offices. A, there's, just a, to, there's a dedicated group that comes <laughs> over and they come back just and they Just to go utilize on, it, and, you know, I mean, it, and that's just, you know, I mean, that's something fairly nominal. So, I mean, if you give them something exciting to walk towards, maybe, maybe they come more often. I would have thought that would have been a big skateboarding place all the way down the hill. <laughs> I haven't seen them. Quiet time. <laughs> don't take this. The, uh, we've got several capital items to discuss. Uh, why don't we... Uh, take them and then do a motion after we have the discussion. Uh, any further questions for Gary? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I, the uh, presentation uh, for the incentives uh, was well done, and, yes. and thank you to you and to the team for... No, I appreciate it. We're excited about it. So on the Village Center plans, and Gary described it to us, and uh, we've asked all the questions that we wanted. Is there a motion uh, to um, apply, to, to ask for a sum to not to exceed $20,000 uh, from the capital fund, uh, the FY21 capital fund, uh, to um, do a uh, village center plan? I'll make that motion. I'll second it, but the only thing is, uh, I want the people to know it is not costing 20000 It's a $40,000 project. So. Well, we've never failed to tell people what the total cost is, and I don't. On a capital plan, it only shows. I don't. I don't. I don't anticipate uh, 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 doing that now, and, and the presentation to the public is going to be the way it is right now, which the summary sheet that says not to exceed twenty thousand, which would be combined with twenty thousand from the operating budget. So it's pretty transparent to the Board of Selectmen, but it's the same presentation that's going to go to the Board of Finance. And any unspent funds would be returned. And any would be unspent. Yeah. So the people need to know that it's a, a total of up to 40000 will be spent on that. Right. The capital request is twenty. The operating uh, supplement is probably twenty, And, uh, you know, I mean, I can't be more clear. I mean, I said it in the thing here, and I <laughs> say it to the Board of Finance, and I'm going to say it to the town. I can't be more clear than that. It's just that on the uh, thing, it only says 20 and 20. So I'm off. On this, uh... Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't insult the intelligence of the of our folks. I, I know they know 20 and 20 equals 40. Sometimes they look at it, and it's like, ah, he just wrote down 20,000 twice. <laughs> I think we've had the discussion. <laughs> so. Well, the motion was made. There's a discussion, so. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next uh, capital item is the uh, fire study. Uh, the idea would be to issue an RFP based on the attached specifications, and I gave you. Uh, the, uh, the some of the, the, the uh, specifications that we would craft into an RFP, uh, and uh, we uh, would uh, go for the study. The uh, study would be uh, uh, we would uh, do an RFP, uh, choose a consultant, and put together a committee to start working on it. 
it would be a capital request not to exceed 50,000, slightly different than the one we had uh, at our last meeting. Uh, uh, I, it was 55 and change or something like that, or 51 and change, and I just rounded the number up. So it would, uh, the, uh, the plan would be to look at what the volunteer fire department uh, of the future needs to look at. And again, we did a roadmap. It would look at system design and improvement, service delivery, uh, analysis, uh, look at operations, look at surrounding towns uh, and strategic plans. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, uh, also uh, you know, a, 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 long, a short and long-term strategic plan. Um, so uh, I think it's something that we need to do. Uh, and uh, I, I support it. I'll make a motion to approve that. I'll second it, but you know me, I got comments. Uh, that price seems extremely exorbitant just for a study. The, uh, Why the, is it so much? The chief, uh, the chief did a uh, did a study of the study, uh, and uh, the range that he was given was uh, uh, twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars. Uh, and then when he started to do additional research on it, it was more thirty-five, forty to fifty thousand. So the fifty thousand dollars is a realistic number. It, it doesn't mean we're going to spend it. We would return anything that we didn't have to re, uh, expend, and we don't wouldn't necessarily uh, tell the bidders on the RFP uh, what we you know, what we have. Uh, so you know, I well, I, I certainly understand. At fifty thousand is a lot of money. I think that's the, the chief has found that that's market rate right now for a study of this sort. And one other question: Who is this Garcia Garcia group or whatever? That oh, this this was just a uh, uh, something that the chief had yes. uh, had reached out to. Uh, chief, would you like to? Yeah, I looked at <clears throat> the minor companies that are doing fire department studies and then some of the major players, the International Association of Fire Chiefs has a consultant company, ESCI, and they give a flat rate based on the number of fire stations, uh, based on two fire stations in East Granby, we'd be paying $48,000 for the, uh, to have a study done. No. <clears throat> I also talk to people that do smaller fire departments, smaller EMS agencies, and you know, it, like Jim said, a cost estimate between twenty-five and thirty-five thousand um, dollars certainly is in the, the you know the great possibility. So I think when you you know when you look at all those, I think you have to have some uh, um, ability to uh, talk to everybody um, that would like to bid on this proposal, and certainly. Uh, I'm not saying that the town would be interested in a, in a more costly study, but certainly have the flexibility to do that if certain issues were raised. And, and this group, John, is just something, that, it's a resource that the right. chief the used. company, you know, yeah. the, for, um, they were a group of uh, retired uh, fire chiefs that are no longer in business, and, you know, they just gave that to me as a sample and some of uh, Yeah, I, 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 I asked the chief for, you know, what sorts of things will we want to have in an RFP? And he was able to come up with this. So, so this group wouldn't be bidding on No, them. they don't exist okay. anymore, John. Because otherwise it would be almost like a, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, they're, okay. No, they're, they're no, this is just a resource that, they, that the chief provided to me so that I could talk to you about some of the things that we would want it to be. Right. I know a lot of companies that go ahead and write the request for proposal when they know that they're going to be bidding on it. So. They write it to make it difficult for yeah. someone else. Well, we certainly, uh, we, 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 a valid point, and we certainly don't operate like that. We don't let anybody write the RFP other than our own folks, or we may even, you know, uh, we may even want to have a, uh, have some help on the RFP where somebody uh, uh, who specializes in, uh, in fire department RFP helps us put it together. Okay, so we had a, a motion made and seconded, and we had the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. And again, it's a sum not to exceed fifty thousand uh, dollars for the RFP on the uh, on the fire study, fire department study.
and uh, standard language will be uh, uh, any unspent funds will be returned to the capital fund. Um, third item is uh, the fire technology. Uh, the chief and I have been working on this. We thought that uh, we might have an opportunity to buy some software, and that's why we have changed the request to 21,000 uh, at the last meeting. Um, chief, upon further research, uh, has looked at it, and the uh, the software. And first of all, we're getting a 50% discount from the software through our affiliation with the Tolland uh, Dispatch. Uh, and second of all, uh, the chief likes the idea of it uh, being us buying it, and the you know, you know, so we buy it through the operating budget. And when I say buying with quotation marks. What we're doing is, is we're we're getting the software, but it would be constantly updated, so we're not locked into something. That, you know, five years from now, where we say, well, this is antiquated. It would be something where it, uh, the quote that I got was from the chief would be for three years worth of the software. If we chose to continue to have it year four or five, we'd get the latest edition. So you get the benefit. Uh, so it's worth renting as opposed to buying. Uh, and it's, the chief. It's cloud based. We're not purchasing per seat, which I'm sure, Joe, you're familiar with. And the fire marshal's office uh, would be incorporated into the software usage with us. So and, the, the, and the operating cost is, is roughly three thousand uh, dollars that it would be a budgetary operating right. item. What we would want the capital purchase is a sum not to exceed seven thousand dollars to buy uh, four iPad air computers and four docking stations. Chief is, is firming up uh, quotes for me on that but he's got estimates uh, in his estimate was sixty eight hundred. Uh, so if we do 7,000 and between now and when I go to the Board of Finance, if I have the quotes, that would be right. helpful. Thank you. Is this one of those uh, state bid items that we can buy those iPads or is it not it, completely it, on it? Right now, and I'll have to check a little deeper with Department of Administrative Services, right now there are, is no state contract for fire service equipment. There may be a, a specific IT um, contract out there that I still have to research further. And um, there is a contract through uh, the state of Massachusetts for their component of the Department of Administrative Services that we could purchase off also. And then certainly I think the other point is that uh, we could still solicit bids um, if necessary. Now, I'm going to assume that you guys probably exhausted all the grant positions for this and because our town probably just doesn't qualify because of our outlaws. Yeah, it's... Yeah, we're... Uh, the chief uh, has uh, done large and small grant requests and we uh, have not had the success that yeah, we Yeah, we're a tough... Uh, and because we're a, you know, we're, we're a, a, a good community uh, and they look at the balance sheets and they look for communities that aren't necessarily as financially strong. So sometimes you get penalized for being responsible. Okay, so I'll make a motion to approve that seven thousand dollar request. So, uh, Chief, seven thousand will cover. Yeah, I believe we're we'll make that work. Yes. Okay. Second day. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any others? Okay, the uh, fourth capital item is uh, rescue and replacement, uh, rescue eight replacement, I should say. The department is working with a broker for an opportunistic purchase of a rescue truck and is uh, requesting a sum not to exceed 225000 to purchase and equip the vehicle. In your package, I gave you some uh, dialogue, some narrative on that, where the uh, chief and the assistant chief talk about the uh, uh, current walk-in body versus the uh, non-walk-in body uh, and that uh, the uh, rescue truck would be uh, looking at at least 20 years worth, 15 to 20 years worth of life out of it. Um, the, uh, I've, uh, he, uh, the chief attached a picture of the current uh, 1983 uh, rescue vehicle that we would be looking to uh, replace 
by the way, uh, the DPW uh, needs a utility truck, uh, so uh, we would not uh, get rid of this. We would actually recycle it to DPW for, for, uh, for a utility truck for them. Um, and then there's two pictures, one small and one big one, regarding the Pierce Quantum Rescue Truck that is currently uh, available. It's 169,000. It's a 2001 unit with uh, 12,000 miles on it. and uh, what is it? Seven? Yeah, seventeen hundred dollars on it, uh, and so you know there's no commitment yet, but we uh, have shown interest in the broker, uh, and it's something that the chief and the apparatus committee would. That's the type of vehicle that they would like to to look at. We would go to the town for the two hundred and twenty-five thousand, uh, explain what it is that we'd be looking to do, but then they'd have the two hundred and twenty-five thousand where they could make an opportunistic buy, uh, and. These things, when they come up, Chief, how quickly do they, they go? Uh, They're usually gone within a month. But this one's still available as of yesterday. Right. right. We uh, we took time last Friday and drove uh, to Pennsylvania and saw it. And uh, we have a uh, conceptual agreement that uh, we're interested in wish to purchase. So we have uh, a handshake agreement. Does anybody? Like, no, no firm commitment. Right, but right. I mean, has, but any, interest. has anybody inspected the truck for serviceability? Because I'm sure it's used. You probably don't get any warranty, right? It's the, the, the well. The answer to that is yes and no. For additional price, you can get a warranty. But if I think if you look at that, John, you're getting a truck for less than less than half price. It's only got. 12,000 miles on it and 1,700 hours. I think the extra $20,000 that you would pay for the one-year warranty, I, I really don't think that it warrants that, uh, you know, that cost. Now you've done a pretty good look-see at it. Right, yeah. We, the, um, when we were down there, we looked at all the maintenance records. As a matter of fact, uh, this week they sent the truck back to the dealer for service and then annual uh, DOT inspection, and we had our fire department mechanic on the other end of a Zoom uh, link with a phone, and he asked us to show him different compartments of the uh, components of the truck, and he was happy with the condition. This truck is in very, very good shape. You know, I think if we were going to spec a new truck, this would be very, very close to uh, what we would be looking for. In your opinion, how long do you think this will serve the town? Oh, this, this, definitely 15 to 20 years. Okay. Now, uh, Carrie, just a quick summary of uh, walk-in versus non-walk-in and the so, advantage to the fire department. Right. So the big difference is if you look at our current rescue truck, that has what's called a walk-in body in the back. So the compartment where uh, the driver sits, it's just a driver and somebody sitting next to him. The remainder of the crew, up to six people, have to walk into the back of the truck and occupy a hallway in the center of the body. What that does is literally it cuts the potential stored space of equipment by a third down in, the, uh, in that truck. In 1983, that was a state-of-the-art rescue. Everybody was buying. In this day and age, only the, really the cities are staying with the walk-in rescues and everybody else is buying a non-walk-in. So what happens is the entire body um, utilizes that uh, compartment space for storage space. And the one we're looking at, for instance, has um, slide-through shelves that it can go to the driver's side as well as the officer's side of the cab. So it, it just gives you more flexibility and a tremendous amount of additional storage. Sounds a little safer too, doesn't it? Yeah, everybody is in a, uh, in a modern cab with, you know, three-point seat, seat belts. So it's, it, it is a better uh, configuration than, for, you know, the truck we have now was uh, people put, you know, conventional seat belts in it to, to hold people on the bench seat in the back. So, yeah, we'd be moving to something that's extremely more safe.
So we'd still be able to transport the same number of people. We're not going to need to get an additional no troop oh, transport no. vehicle. Yeah, this this truck has the ability to transport eight people in the cab. Okay. Two in the front and six in the back. Okay. Motion by Joe. I'll second that. The only other thing is, when do you think you're actually going to get it? If this one's gone, will we allow the fire department to up to so many months or years to expend the funds, or how will that? Well, we'd have a year, right? Um, right. With, the, with the capital project. Okay. Yeah. So once it's approved, you're basically going to be scouring the magazines or internet or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been doing that for over a year now. Yeah. I mean, we've been uh, Carrie and I have been working on this for a year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, two, ma two major players, two major brokers, and we've been in constant contact. Okay. And, you know, like uh, Jim said, once we uh, pull the trigger going through the finance board and town meeting, we'll act quickly. Very good. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, unanimous. And, um, and, you know, again, all of these motions will say uh, the, the usual language about some not to exceed and uh, the return to capital fund. Uh, and on the vehicle, it'll say purchase and equip. Okay, on the uh, hose, uh, I know you're going to give me three quotes before Tuesday for that, the hose yes. is also. But um, the, uh, uh, so there's $25,000. Now, the previous items were all on the FY21 capital list, uh, with the exception of the Rescue 8 replacement, that's FY22 capital money, uh, and then the hose would be FY22 capital money. Um, and the, uh, the fire department's looking to purchase uh, 30 lengths of uh, five inch hose, 20 lengths will be 100 sec foot sections, Five lengths will be 50 foot sections, five will be 25 uh, foot sections. They would provide each engine with 10 100 foot sections or 1,000 uh, lines of hose, uh, two uh, 50 uh, foot sections and two 25 foot sections. Um, and the remaining uh, 50 and 25 foot sections would uh, go uh, uh, onto the tanker as was mentioned at a previous meeting. Our machines are capable of accepting the five-inch uh, hose, and uh, this would include uh, the adapters that would be needed uh, and um, with the fittings that would be needed. Uh, there uh, is not a, as the chief mentioned, there's not a VIP uh, contract in, uh, in place with Connecticut Department of Administrative Services, uh, and uh, there are two vendors uh, that are on the state contract. Uh, the State Department, uh, State uh, Fire Academy is also using uh, Safeware, uh, so uh, the chief will button up the details, but he's confident that the 25000 will buy what we need it to buy and replace the 4-inch, uh, um, re A, replace some uh, hose that never made the test, uh, that um, passed the test, uh, the safety test, and uh, will replace the, the 4 foots. So we will be completely 5 foot. Five inch, yeah, that's correct. Five, sorry. Five yeah, inch. and and then the other thing that we haven't talked about, but we will move it forward. The current four inch hose we will be able to dispose of through a sale through a municipal bid or whatever. Right. Right. So we cover, you know, a little bit of money. And, and, yeah, and then uh, that goes. That would go back to the general. Correct. So, so should that be worded in the? Uh, um, capital request. The um, sell and dispose and return of any money. Yeah, we, we certainly could put that in there. Okay, so I'll make that motion. Second that. Let me write the let me write the pot down. <laughs> now this this isn't something that we could use any of the COVID money on, is no. it? Sure. I am positive. I'm looking uh, high and low, John. I'm looking high and water or something. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning a lot more about those. Uh, what is uh, applicable? I'm just what worried is. that some of that money's not going to be spent, and the state's going to take it back. <laughs> uh, I'm, I think that we will do uh, what we need to do to make sure that thoughtful, appropriate purchases are made with the 1.5 million, 
and we're going to do a lot of good in the town. Uh, some infrastructure, uh, broadband, uh, and, and sewer along with other projects. Uh, but you have to have a COVID hook with it, John, and we don't have a COVID hook with this. But not a fire on a house that might have had COVID. <laughs> Okay, so John made the motion. Joe, thank you for bearing with me as I wrote it down. And Joe, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And I believe that's uh, all the fire items that we're going to have, Chief. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so thank much you. for coming. Members are great. We really appreciate you uh, taking action on this. Take care. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks. Police cruiser, which we've talked about before. Uh, it, this is on the bid list. It's uh, MHQ. Uh, the uh, quotes for $47,914. Uh, with uh, computer and radio equipment, uh, it's uh, another $7,000. So the request is for some not to exceed $55,000. I just would point out to you that you know, we had 50,000 in uh, on the previous plan. The new plan has the 55. All this balances, uh, and uh, basically uh, the uh, the 5,000 plus the uh, money for the uh, uh, overhead door uh, replacement came out of the savings uh, from what we thought we were going to spend on the fire software. So everything balances. Uh, so the cruiser is, uh, if the sum would be uh, 55,000, not to exceed 55,000, then we would order it. Uh, and uh, as soon as we got approval from the town, uh, there's a three to four month delay before you get these things. I'll second it. And one question though, is this a, uh, just a vehicle or is it a, uh, I mean, is it a car or is it an SUV? It's a SUV, John. An SUV. We had an internal discussion about SUV versus Jeep, uh, not Jeep, uh, truck, uh, pickup truck, and um, we uh, the uh, the discussion internally was let's stick with the SUV. Uh, and, you know, we do have some uh, times that uh, they do need a truck. Whether you know, if there was putting uh, you know cones out for a, you know for a an accident or something like that, but. We do have other vehicles uh, that they could use, so DPW vehicles. Right. Or the fire department. Or the fire department, absolutely. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Also, we talked already about the, uh, the uh, one-ton dump truck. Could you go um, back to the police cruiser? Are we disposing of one, or are we keeping what we have? The um, we're um, we're probably going to salvage one. Salvage one for parts, basically. So yes, it's or, or sell it for. Sure. Okay, so shouldn't we have had that in uh, motion to return any funds? I mean, maybe too late because we already voted on it. Well, no, I mean, but the, the funds, and we certainly, uh, you know, we can take the friendly amendment of uh, any, uh, any any proceeds on the sale of the cruiser as being replaced will be returned to the general fund. Okay, so I make that amendment. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's that's why. So Joe, you agree with that? Yeah, I just could call you I didn't like seeing too many built up in the parking lot over there. Yeah. I mean, we have even we'll though have I more got, vehicles I, and officers. Even, <laughs> even though I got uh, opportunistic buys and it helped us, it, it, what it did is the, uh, the two uh, or three vehicles that we got from other towns for less than $2,500 each allowed us to use those on private jobs so that we weren't burning the miles and the hours on the new vehicles. So it helped us stretch it out. I didn't say it was bad things. <laughs> <laughs> Insurance and well, we don't pay taxes, but insurance and upkeep or whatever, uneven use vehicles. Okay, so we're unanimous on on uh, on that that we already did, and we had the friendly amendment, uh, and then the one-ton uh, truck. Uh, so there's three quotes on that. Uh, 
The task that put forward is the low bid, uh, adding 72.89 just to make the numbers round for the plow and sander. Total request not to exceed 65,000. I would notice. Uh, I would also mention that in uh, in action, we're going to take on closing capital accounts. Uh, you know, we uh, are returning. I think what's it, seven thousand uh, dollars on a plow truck. So whenever we have an opportunistic buy, we don't. You know, we 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 do it, and we only send the money back into the into the town general fund. So uh, I'm confident that the sixty-five thousand is going to cover what we needed to do. But if it is even better, then uh, the money would be returned. So are we? Retiring another vehicle because I know some of the, you know, yeah. adding another one. Yeah. Okay. The question I had last time is still set on quote body primer only. Did you find out? It's yeah, I, Eddie said it's fully painted. Fully painted. So I'll make a motion to approve. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. The compactor pad for eight thousand dollars. That's the estimate that Eddie gave me. That uh, that we uh, you know we should uh, ask for and request as a capital item. Um, the DPW is going to do the work and everything, but it's not like I have you know a quote that I can get from a concrete vendor or anything. So I would explain it that way to the board of selectmen, but I'd explain it that way to the board of finance and to to the town meeting that. Uh, and we're, we uh, we based on, on uh, what we think the concrete in the yards yardage uh, is going to cost. That uh, it's eight thousand dollars a handout, and we'll do uh, the uh, the prep work ourselves. Okay, so maybe somebody's going to ask us like, how, how much are we paying per yard of concrete? How many yards might we be expecting? I mean, even concrete forms now are expensive because they're made out of wood, but. I'm sure Eddie's probably got some of that laying around. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we can figure it out. The, uh, I don't have that information. Uh, All right. Any, is there a, a motion to approve the capital request for 8,000? I'll make the motion. Second. What I will do is, is I will uh, I will get uh, uh, information regarding the regard concrete costs and how many yards we anticipate. I mean, I know it's pretty, it, it's pretty expensive. At least it was when we were looking at a project in Bloomfield. So it's probably right. Okay, and uh, let's see. So we've got a motion by John Joe. I don't think we had to vote on it. So we need to vote on it. Aye. 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 And then the, uh, we have also discussed this, uh, the uh, overhead door, the, um, and uh, the overhead door. Uh, this is a vendor that we always use for the overhead doors, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's a large outfit. Uh, the um, quote is uh, for $7,400 when uh, asking for $7,500 just in case. It's not in the cap, it was not in the cap five year plan, and I did put it in the plan and I did rework it. I'll make a motion to approve it. I'll second. And just to mention that the idea would be to replace one door and then use the parts on others to replace the other doors. And it's the rust that happens uh, from the um, salt. Yeah, salt. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous.
the, um, uh, the, and I'm fine with it, the uh, economic development uh, portion of the meeting went a little longer than I thought it was going to, but I thought that was really good information and I think it was a good basis for us to start to put together a policy. I also should mention that the, uh, we will uh, request that the Board of Finance allow us to carry over 20,000 from FY20 payroll software into FY22 along with the $98,000 request for air pack units to be carried over to FY22. And you also have the uh, insulation project for Town Hall scheduled for this summer or is it just planning uh, we, on scheduling? Uh, uh, Ray Carlson uh, is, uh, is working on setting that up. He's, uh, he, uh, I, I reviewed it with him last week to uh, make sure that we uh, get some quotes on it and see you know, what the scope of work would be and get it done this summer. It's basically just adding insulation in Yeah, the blowing attic. some insulation in there probably, although maybe it's the rules. And if there's anything extra, I had him, uh, his mission is to take a look at the public safety and at the community center and see if there's any funds left to go ahead and put some insulation in there too. Now, is this something that we can maybe do on our own? Because if you buy enough of that blow-in insulation, they'll let you use the machine yourself, or is this a little more detailed? This this, this may be, a, uh, although we have a lot of skills. Right. We have a lot of skills. Uh, and maybe I wouldn't, something to look at. And I won't rule it out. Uh, right. He's in the middle of uh, putting the proposal together. Okay, next order of business is to consider and act upon the tax collector suspense report. The report is uh, for, uh, uh, shows $40,529 uh, $40, for motor vehicles, $825 for personal property. Even though it's uh, the items would be put on the suspension list, doesn't mean we stop collecting them. Uh, and we would continue to collect them right now we're collecting in-house because CIBI uh, is no longer in business, or at least in Connecticut. So the, um, uh, it would be uh, in 2019, this is motor vehicle, primarily motor vehicles and at the end, uh, personal property. Uh, motor vehicles would be uh, for 2019, it's two f uh, folks that are deceased, uh, it'd be $1,242, uh, there's a, uh, 2018 uh, is $89, uh, again, deceased. Uh, and then 2016 would be a total of 14629 15362 in 2015. In 2012, $294. And in 2011, $8,705. In 2010, $205. So you add it all up, that comes to $40,529. And then personal property, there's uh, 415 from a bankrupt corporation, uh, well, business, I should say, and uh, $410 from someone that is deceased. So that's 825. So this would be us recommending, uh, based on the recommendation of the tax collector to us, recommending to the Board of Finance that um, these uh, be put on the suspension list. Okay, I'll make that motion. Second that. I'm gonna make like one comment on the um, motor vehicle lease or motor vehicle taxes like for deceased people. The tax bills don't go out if, if someone is deceased until the actual next schedule tax bill is supposed to go out. So it makes it difficult for the executor of the estate to pay the the taxes because the estate by that time could be closed and all the funds dispersed so there's no way to collect the taxes I don't know if there's something that can be done is like once someone dies can they send the tax bill out earlier to collect it because there's really no way to get the money from a closed out estate I guess I, I don't think um, I because I'm looking at it from my personal point of view I was going to say my I father knew. died I paid the taxes on his vehicle that were due as of the last tax bill, 
but the vehicle was sold just recently, so I know there's going to be a supplemental partial bill. I turn the plates in, but it's not going to be for quite a while that I receive another tax bill, and by that time, I think the estate will be closed out, all the funds will be dispersed, and there'll be no one to go after. They wouldn't be able to issue a new tax bill because that, that's prescribed uh, by the uh, statutes. But you know, it, it may be something uh, where they, when they get the notification that someone has died, that goes to the assessor's office, that goes to the tax collector's office, and the tax clerk, uh, the town clerk rather. Uh, they, uh, there may be options that we can look at to to, uh, to help with that by you know notifying the state that. You know th these taxes are going to be coming at X amount of dollars or something like that, mm -hmm. so they could be aware of it, or even uh, well, well, we'll have to see because it's not like you can prepay and there's you know there's other yeah. things, but but there there you, we'll see if there's a way. I mean, maybe state law needs to be changed to something mm -hmm. that we can't fix, but I mean, I can I can see why it's not paid. So right. it's it's just impossible. Well, the, you know, I'll, I'll, closed out. I'll I'll talk to the tax collector, and it may be a state remedy, and right. you know that's something we can you know certainly uh, do research on and talk to our our state representative about. Mm -hmm. There's three or four bills for uh, that we supported uh, that uh, the representative uh, Zawatowski uh, was uh, was uh, bringing forth uh, this past uh, year. Okay, uh, so uh, we've uh, got a motion uh, and discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay, uh, consider uh, and act upon the closing of year-end capital projects. So these projects have been completed. Um, Reval Phase 2, $9,100 is unexpended. $600.77 for the police vehicle that was purchased uh, uh, in FY20 or 19, uh, 20. Uh, and um, this four cents back for the senior minibus. Cut that close off. Uh, huh? <laughs> uh, plow truck is the, that I mentioned a couple minutes ago was $7,000 and the town HVAC project there was $598 left. So the, the, we would need a motion to close uh, as recommended. Make that motion. I'll second that. And uh, I attached the list of uh, actor projects so you can see what's there. And uh, that triggered my insulation conversation with uh, Ray Carlson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Six E consider an act upon tax refunds. We have two refunds, twenty eight dollars and thirty two cents, and two hundred and eighty seven dollars and fifty five cents. Make a motion to approve this. And I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Next order of business is the um, agenda item 6F, East Granby Greater Together Community Fund uh, grant application. The um, Commission on Aging has asked me to uh, submit a, uh, a grant application to the Greater Together Community Fund. They're looking for projects to underwrite between $250 and $25,000. Uh, it's funded by the Hartford Foundation. Um, the uh, uh, eligibility is any nonprofit uh, who's a 501c3 or municipalities uh, also qualify. The Commission on Aging asked me to apply for the grant to replace the carpet at the East Granby Senior Community Center. The carpet squares, the current carpet squares, are adhered to the concrete floor. Uh, depending on the weather, they are visible or more visible. Um, new carpet tiles for the community center, uh, corridors, and office uh, based on a January quote that we got was $17,620. Our broad loom would be $18,500. We are looking for a quote um, for vinyl plank flooring. I may not have it for uh, uh, 
uh, may not have it in time for the request, which has to be submitted by uh, June uh, 15th. Uh, the uh, uh, senior services person, uh, director, uh, went to uh, to Granby and looked at their floor that they've had for 10 years. They've got good use on it. They don't have slip and falls or anything. It's like a that. vinyl plank there. And vinyl plank. So um, anyways, the, uh, uh, what I'm looking for is for the Board of Selectmen to decide that they want to apply for the grant uh, if you do. My only concern is I wouldn't want the town to be chosen at the expense of a smaller organization that doesn't have our resources. Um, but the project would benefit townspeople without using uh, tax dollars. Um, and uh, we would ask for like $9,000 or $10,000. Uh, we just received a uh, bequest from a longtime member of, uh, of the Commission on Aging and longtime resident of East Granby, B. Adams, uh, and uh, that um, was received. It was a $10,000 check, so perhaps it's something where uh, the grant funds uh, and the, uh, you know, we'd have to work with the Commission on Aging on it, but the grant funds and the bequest could. Um, make it a tax-free item for uh, uh, not using tax dollars for our residents, if it was accepted. I think it's a good idea. The only thing is if they put vinyl floor and you take the carpeting and put the vinyl floor in, I think it would increase the sound level in there. Well, the, the sound level, but also uh, the, the, the real problem that you have is uh, you know when you rip everything up, how, what's the condition of the floor? Is it right, level? You have to put a leveler in, start yeah. scraping and sanding. Yeah. So uh, you know, I mean, if we replace what we've got now with what you know, if we replace it with similar, but just new and fresh and not dirty. Right. Uh, the uh, you know, I mean, that that could be uh, could be a good project. That's what I would recommend that we, uh, unless I get. Uh, uh, some information that uh, that tells me differently. Uh, that's what I would recommend. I, I mean, I guess we could we could you know kind of skate that by just saying uh, for to replace the flooring. Right. I mean, I kind of like the squares, but I do see what they're saying that the edges come up. But it's like there's only certain high wear areas in there where. If they're worn out, you just go ahead and replace those few squares, and it almost looks like it's new. But if you put one huge piece in, once those areas are worn, you're pretty much forced into redoing the entire yeah, floor. I mean, and, and we've replaced, uh, I mean, it's probably 10 or 12 years old now, uh, and we've, re, you know, we've replaced some of the squares ourselves. Uh, that you know, Somebody dropped a plate of food on, and you, know, you steam it, and you try to get it out, and you can't get it out. So uh, there is, uh, the, the squares are convenient that way. All right. Oh, yeah. You've got to have a decision on this. Yeah, so I can. So, uh, so it's your motion to, or I want to share a discussion. No, I just. Uh, I mean, we can just approve the dollar amount and let the COA decide on well, the. Well, you don't even have mean? to, you, you don't even have to do that. All you have to do is authorize me to make a request. I'll do that. So you're authorizing me to apply, and do a second at that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. And uh, appointments. Uh, we have uh, a. Uh, Request from uh, the Commission on Aging to appoint David Emery as a alternate for the Commission on Aging. Uh, he lives on uh, Hartford Avenue here in East Granby. Uh, he's a Republican. I would imagine that it's replacing the Republican seat. Uh, and that was submitted by the chair of the, uh, of the Commission on Aging. I'll make that motion. Second. Welcome in the board. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Right. Unanimous. The uh, next and last document that you have uh, is an addition. Uh, so can I have a motion to add item 6E? 
each, which would be year-end transfer requests to the agenda? I'll make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Okay. And so this is uh, this is actually pretty early, but it's the way the timing of the calendar is to to come up with okay, where are we going to be? You know, just right. Where are we going to be over it? Where are we going to have uh, be favorable? Um, so at this point, this is what it looks like. Uh, so the. Uh, General government budget is trending approximately $60,000 favorable uh, to have budget uh, through June 2nd. Through June 9th, we're actually uh, about $70,000 favorable. Uh, and that does include the $54,000 contingency. Um, it's a work in process, or progress, I should say. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, but I need to bring a list to the Board of Finance at their next meeting, which is June 15th. Um, so uh, I would, uh, I would, you know, want, want a motion uh, to authorize me to uh, uh, present uh, to the Board of Finance the uh, in, uh, the year-end uh, transfers, uh, knowing that uh, they they may change a little bit from what you're seeing here. Uh, but anything uh, prior to me bringing it to the Board of Finance, uh, I certainly would run it by both of you with emails. I'll make that motion. I'll second it, but I'm going to make a comment. I don't like seeing money coming out of the contingency fund. Well, I, I know it's not going to come out of there. I mean, you must know which departments have yeah. excess. Yeah, the uh, uh, it's it, it's um, ease of process so that you're not nickel and diming departments. So you go for the areas. Of what I did is I looked for areas where there's large chunks. In the in the in the end, we're still re returning you know, sixty thousand dollars to to the town. Uh, it's just um, it makes a lot of sense to use uh, on those uh, the data services eighteen thousand RCC twenty five thousand. Uh, it's just a larger chunk of money, so you don't have five or six departments that you're taking it out. It's for ease. It's it's not you know in the end you're still going to have the amount of the contingency left. It's just a pocket of money that's convenient for bookkeeping. Now what about the RCC? Weren't monies going to come from the uh, COVID relief fund to backfill some of that? Yes, uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's we probably, uh, we're looking at about $9,000 that we're going to be able to use that. We may use less, we may not need 25000 but at this point, uh, that did take into consideration some of the uh, corona relief funds. So if it's 25,000, is with the corona relief already right. backfilling in? Right, it's, uh, we're back, we haven't made the, the actual um, charge to expenses yet, but we're gonna be doing that in the upcoming week. Uh, and it may end up being a little lighter. I won't go to the Board of Finance with a number if it looks like we can do 9,000 instead of 7,000 then I would reduce that number. But right now we're estimating that we can use uh, CRF for 7,000. Any other discussion? All those in favor? I think I'll abstain on that one. And uh, Joe is in favor, and I'm in favor of motion carries. Your concern is the... Well, I just don't like showing the contingency fund being utilized. I think you probably could have shown some other departments John, if I could have showed other departments with not having seven or eight or nine departments listed below, I would have done it. Okay. Well, this is a long one for a while, huh? All right. The, Welcome back. <laughs> uh, the next order of business and public comments, the none. Well, I don't know, public comment, I guess I'll basically announce that I'm, I have to resign because I'm... Uh, 
don't know if this is a good time for it. I, I well, know I'll give you, let me do some housekeeping. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, next order of business after public comment, although you really don't need public comment, you can comment anytime. Okay. Um, the, uh, it would be an executive session. We don't need an executive session. Okay. So, uh, we did one last night, and I gave you the document that showed that we hired the accounts payable person. Right. So, um, uh, John, the floor is yours. Well, you know, due to the upcoming sale of our home, uh, I'm not going to be an elector in the town of East Granby soon, and that's one of the requirements for being a selectman. So. Um, regretfully resigning my position as selectman. It's been a great honor to serve the people of East Granby and work with all you guys. And I'm basically moving on to the next chapter of my life. <laughs> well, we, we certainly wish you well in your next chapter uh, and uh, appreciate the service that you've given to the town on this board and other boards, but specifically this board. And uh, uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. This would have been 10 if ten, I finished, ten, so I'm just years. under 10. So uh, I don't get my 10-year pin. <laughs> we certainly uh, uh, thank you uh, for your, uh, your service and uh, uh, wish you and Lucia uh, the best of your next step of your Thanks. And I made it effective June 17th because we have an RTC meeting on the 16th, which is a Wednesday, and I still have the keys to the Senior Community Center. So I figured while I'm still selectman, I'll let them in, and then after okay, that, so I'll hand over the keys. Okay, so the resignation is, so you've given us give notice, you notice of the today, right, but I'm an effective date of the resignation will be the 17th of June, because I didn't think you would want me to have the keys if I'm no longer a selectman. No, I, I, would, I would say, hey, here's, your ten year, here's your 10-year pen, <laughs> <Right>. where's my key? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, effective uh, June 17th, but we appreciate the, uh, right. the service and the announcement. And, the and it's just a handwritten letter, but I don't know who you got to give it uh, to. Town clerk. Okay. So, uh, so it goes to uh, the, uh, the the letter of resignation effective June seventeenth will be filed with the town clerk. Okay. Uh, and uh, John, I, I'm sorry to see you uh, go. I I have to say you've always been extremely well prepared for these meetings and any meeting I've ever participated in with you, and I've really always been impressed by that and uh, your service to the town has you put in a lot of time and you've really um, I think added a lot because you know in a big way uh, you researched things and came prepared and always had uh, you know sparked conversation and, and that type of thing so um, personally I thank you for your service and um, making me more prepared because seeing you that prepared was inspiring so I, I really appreciate everything. Thank you. It's been fun, actually. Yeah. It does take up an awful lot of time, so, you know, anybody that thinks that they can just jump right in, don't just show for the meetings just to be there. They really need to put some thought and effort. And, and I think, uh, you know, as, you know, as we look uh, over uh, 14 years and 10 years and uh, four years plus, uh, you know, I think we can be proud of the... Uh, uh, not always did we always agree, but we, I think we can be proud of the fact that we looked at things and said, okay, what's, what's the benefit to the town? And right. And maybe, Jim, you can double check with the town clerk how many years it has been. I think it's coming up on 10, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I wasn't, I, I, I uh, wasn't sure if Dan was two terms or three terms. But Dan was two. Well, then, you, then you're 10 okay. years. Because you were, I'm you, you're the same time as Dan. You started at yeah. the same time as Dan. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, I mean the uh, uh, you know I, I mean we've done a, a, I think collectively as a board and as a as a town we've done a lot of good things to benefit the the town whether it's been paving roads or fixing roofs or or finishing uh, school addition projects or finishing the Greenway Bridge or things like that so uh, I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish uh, as a board of selectmen and thank you for your efforts. Thank you very much, sir. And the um, town school building committee, I guess, as long as I'm still here, that, that doesn't take up too much time. I guess I can still stick around for that, right? Yes. There's no point in designing from that unless something happens where I'm away or whatever. But yeah, the, this uh, way you'll still have a quorum. <laughs> Try to have a quorum. 
Yeah, the uh, the, the building committee. Uh, yeah, as long as you're in town, uh, okay. it, it will work. And you're in frequent meetings now because there's right. less and less to do. Right. But uh, now with the air conditioning project uh, going full board, we'll probably have a couple of meetings. But. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, so at nine fourteen, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. Final one. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Amen.